Section 47 of Essays, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. Essays, Book 2, by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Apology for Raymond Sebon, Part 7. We are to observe that to everything nothing is more dear and estimable than its being. The lion, the eagle, the dolphin prize nothing above their own kind. And that everything assimilates the qualities of all other things to its own proper qualities which we may indeed extend or contract, but that's all. For beyond that relation and principle, our imagination cannot go, can guess at nothing else, nor possibly go out thence, nor stretch beyond it. Whence spring these ancient conclusions? Of all forms, the most beautiful is that of man. Therefore God must be of that form, no one can be happy without virtue, nor virtue be without reason, and reason cannot inhabit anywhere but in a human shape. God is therefore clothed in a human figure. Ita est informatum et anticipatum mentibus nostris, ut homini, cum de Deo cogitet, forma occurat humana. It is so imprinted in our minds, and the fancy is so prepossessed with it, that when a man thinks of God, a human figure ever presents itself to the imagination. Therefore it was that Xenophanes pleasantly said, that if beasts frame any gods to themselves, as tis likely they do, they make them certainly such as themselves are, and glorify themselves in it, as we do. For why may not a goose say thus, All the parts of the universe I have an interest in. The earth serves me to walk upon, the sun to light me, the stars have their influence upon me, I have such an advantage by the winds, and such by the waters, there is nothing that yon heavenly roof looks upon so favorably as me. I am the darling of nature. Is it not man that keeps, lodges, and serves me? Tis for me that he both sows and grinds. If he eats me, he does the same by his fellow men, and so do I the worms that kill and devour him as much might be said by a crane, and with greater confidence upon the account of the liberty of his flight and the possession of that high and beautiful region. Tam blanda conciliatrix et tam sui est lena ipsa natura. So flattering and wheedling a bawd is nature to herself. Now by the same consequence the destinies are then for us, for us the world, it shines, it thunders for us, creator and creatures, all are for us. Tis the mark and point to which the universality of things aims. Look into the records that philosophy has kept for two thousand years and more, of the affairs of heaven. The gods all that while have neither acted nor spoken but for man. She does not allow them any other consultation or occupation. See them here against us in war. Domitosque Herculea manu telluris juvenis unde periculum fulgens contremuit domus Saturni veteris. The brawny sons of earth, subdued by hand, of Hercules on the Phlegraean strand, 
where the rude shock did such an uproar make as made old saturn's sparkling palace shake and here you shall see them participate of our troubles to make a return for our having so often shared in theirs neptunus muros magnoque emota tridenti fundamenta quatit totamque a sedibus urbem eruit hic juno scaes saevissima portas prima tenet amidst that smother neptune holds his place below the wall's foundation drives his mace and heaves the city from its solid base see where in arms the cruel juno stands full in the scaean gate the caunians jealous of the authority of their own proper gods armed themselves on the days of their devotion and through the whole of their precincts ran cutting and slashing the air with their swords by that means to drive away and banish all foreign gods out of their territory their powers are limited according to our necessity this cures horses that men that the plague that the scurf that the physic one cures one sort of itch another another adeo minimis etiam rebus prava religio inserit deos at such a rate does false religion create gods for the most contemptible uses this one makes grapes grow that onions this has the precedence over lechery that over merchandise for every sort of artisan a god this has his province and reputation in the east that his in the west hic ilius arma hic curus fuit here lay her armor here her chariot stood o sancte apollo qui umbilicum certum terrarum obtines o sacred phoebus who with glorious ray from the earth's centre dost thy light display palada cecropidae minoia creta dianam vulcanum telus hypsipilea colit junonem sparte pelopeadesque micenae pinigerum fauni mainalis ora caput mars latio venerandus erat the athenians palace cynthia crete adore vulcan is worshipped on the lemnian shore proud juno's altars are by spartans fed the arcadians worship faunus and tis said to mars by italy is homage paid this has only one town or family in his possession that lives alone that in company either voluntary or upon necessity Junctaque sunt magno templa nepotis avo and temples to the nephew joined are to those were reared to the great grandfather in here are some so wretched and mean for the number amounts to six and thirty thousand that they must pack five or six together to produce one ear of corn and thence take their several names three to a door that of the plank that of the hinge and that of the threshold four to a child protectors of his swathing clouts his drink meat and sucking some certain some uncertain and doubtful and some that are not yet entered paradise quos quoniam celi nondum dignamor honore quas dedimus certe terras habitare sinamus whom since we yet not worthy think of heaven we suffer to possess the earth we've given there are amongst them physicians poets and civilians some of a mean betwixt the divine and human nature 
mediators betwixt God and us, adorned with a certain second and diminutive sort of adoration, infinite in titles and offices, some good, others ill, some old and decrepit, and some that are mortal. For Chrysippus was of opinion that in the last conflagration of the world all the gods were to die but Jupiter. Man makes a thousand pretty societies betwixt God and him. Is he not his countryman? Jovis in Cunabula Cretin Crete, the cradle of Jupiter and this is the excuse that, upon consideration of this subject, Skywola, a high priest, and Waro, a great theologian in their times, make us, that it is necessary that the people should be ignorant of many things that are true, and believe many things that are false. Cum veritatem qua liberetur inquirat credatur, ei expedire quod falitur seeing he inquires into the truth by which he would be made free tis fit he should be deceived human eyes cannot perceive things but by the forms they know and we do not remember what a leap miserable phaeton took for attempting to guide his father's horses with a mortal hand the mind of man falls into as great a depth and is after the same manner bruised and shattered by his own rashness. If you ask of philosophy, of what matter the heavens and the sun are, what answer will she return, if not that it is iron, or, with Anaxagoras, stone, or some other matter that she makes use of? If a man inquire of Zeno what nature is, a fire says he, an artisan, proper for generation and regularly proceeding. Archimedes, master of that science which attributes to itself the precedency before all others for truth and certainty. The sun, says he, is a god of red-hot iron. Was not this a fine imagination extracted from the inevitable necessity of geometrical demonstrations. Yet not so inevitable and useful, but that Socrates thought it was enough to know so much of geometry only as to measure the land a man bought or sold. And that Polyinus, who had been a great and famous doctor in it, despised it, as full of falsity and manifest vanity, after he had once tasted the delicate fruits of the lozily gardens of Epicurus. Socrates, in Xenophon, concerning this affair, says of Anaxagoras, reputed by antiquity learned above all others in celestial and divine matters, that he had cracked his brain, as all other men do, who too immoderately search into knowledges which nothing belong to them. When he made the sun to be a burning stone, he did not consider that a stone does not shine in the fire, and, which is worse, that it will there consume. And in making the sun and fire one, that fire does not turn the complexions black in shining upon them, that we are able to look fixedly upon fire, and that fire kills herbs and plants. Tis Socrates's opinion, and mine too, that the best judging of heaven is not to judge of it at all. Plato, having occasion, in his Timaeus, to speak of the demons, this undertaking, says he, exceeds my ability. We are therefore to believe those ancients who said they were begotten by them. Tis against all reason to refuse a man's faith to the children of the gods, 
though what they say should not be proved by any necessary or probable reasons, seeing they engage to speak of domestic and familiar things. Let us see if we have a little more light in the knowledge of human and natural things. Is it not a ridiculous attempt for us to forge for those to whom, by our own confession, our knowledge is not able to attain, another body, and to lend a false form of our own invention, as is manifest in this motion of the planets, to which, seeing our wits cannot possibly arrive, nor conceive their natural conduct, we lend them material, heavy, and substantial springs of our own by which to move. Temo aureus aurea sumai, curvatura rotai, radiorum argenteus ordo. Gold was the axle, and the beam was gold, the wheels with silver spokes on golden circles rolled. You would say that we had had coachmakers, carpenters, and painters that went up on high to make engines of various motions, and to range the wheel-work and interfacings of the heavenly bodies of differing colors about the axis of necessity, according to Plato. Mundus domus est maxima rerum, quam quinque altitonae fragmine zonae, cingunt per quam limbus pictus bis sex signis, stelimicantibus altus in obliquo aetera, lunae bigas aceptat the world's a mansion that doth all things hold which thundering zones in number five enfold through which a girdle painted with twelve signs and that with sparkling constellations shines in heaven's arch marks the diurnal course for the sun's chariot and his fiery horse these are all dreams and fanatic follies. Why will not nature please for once to lay open her bosom to us and plainly discover to us the means and conduct of her movements and prepare our eyes to see them? Good God, what abuse, what mistakes should we discover in our poor science? I am mistaken if that weak knowledge of ours holds any one thing as it really is, and I shall depart hence more ignorant of all other things than my own ignorance. Have I not read in Plato this divine saying that nature is nothing but enigmatic poesy, as if a man might perhaps see a veiled and shady picture breaking out here and there with an infinite variety of false lights to puzzle our conjectures. Latent ista omnia crassis, occultata et circumfusa tenebres, ut nulla acies humani ingenii tanta sit, quae penetrare in celum, teram intrare posit. All those things lie concealed and involved in so dark an obscurity that no point of human wit can be so sharp as to pierce heaven or penetrate the earth. And certainly philosophy is no other than sophisticated poetry. Whence do the ancient writers extract their authorities but from the poets? and the first of them were poets themselves, and writ accordingly. Plato is but a poet unripped. Timon calls him, insultingly, a monstrous forger of miracles. All superhuman sciences make use of the poetic style. Just as women make use of teeth of ivory where the natural are wanting, and instead of their true complexion make one of some artificial matter, as they stuff themselves out with cotton to appear plump, and in the sight of every one do paint, 
patch and trick up themselves with a false and borrowed beauty, so does science, and even our law itself has, they say, legitimate fictions, whereon it builds the truth of its justice. She gives us, in presupposition and for current pay, things which she herself informs us were invented. For these epicycles, eccentrics, and concentrics, which astrology makes use of to carry on the motions of the stars, she gives us for the best she could invent upon that subject. As also, in all the rest, philosophy presents us not that which really is, or what she really believes, but what she has contrived with the greatest and most plausible likelihood of truth, and the quaintest invention. Plato, upon the discourse of the state of human bodies and those of beasts, says, I should know that what I have said is truth, had I the confirmation of an oracle. But this I will affirm, that what I have said is the most likely to be true of anything I could say. Tis not to heaven only that art sends her ropes, engines, and wheels. Let us consider a little what she says of us ourselves and of our contexture. There is not more retrogradation, trepidation, accession, recession, and astonishment in the stars and celestial bodies than they have found out in this poor little human body. In earnest, they have good reason upon that very account to call it the little world. So many tools and parts have they employed to erect and build it. To assist the motions they see in man and the various functions that we find in ourselves, in how many parts have they divided the soul, in how many places lodged it, in how many orders have they divided, and to how many stories have they raised this poor creature, man, besides those that are natural and to be perceived, and how many offices and vocations have they assigned him. They make it an imaginary public thing, Tis a subject that they hold and handle, and they have full power granted to them to rip, place, displace, piece, and stuff it, every one according to his own fancy, and yet they possess it not. They cannot, not in reality only, but even in dreams, so govern it that there will not be some cadence or sound that will escape their architecture, as enormous as it is, and botched with a thousand false and fantastic patches. And it is not reason to excuse them, for though we are satisfied with painters when they paint heaven, earth, seas, mountains, and remote islands, that they give us some slight mark of them, and as of things unknown, are content with a faint and obscure description. Yet when they come and draw us after life, or any other creature which is known and familiar to us, we then require of them a perfect and exact representation of lineaments and colors, and despise them if they fail in it. I am very well pleased with the Milesian girl who observing the philosopher Thales to be always contemplating the celestial arch, and to have his eyes ever gazing upward, laid something in his way that he might stumble over, to put him in mind that it would be time to take up his thoughts about things that are in the clouds, when he had provided for those that were under his feet. Doubtless she advised him well, rather to look to himself than to gaze at heaven, for, as Democritus says by the mouth of Cicero, Quod est ante pedes nemo spectat, celi scrutantur plagas. No man regards what is under his feet. They are always prying towards heaven. 
but our condition will have it so that the knowledge of what we have in hand is as remote from us and as much above the clouds as that of the stars as socrates says in plato that whoever meddles with philosophy may be reproached as thales was by the woman that he sees nothing of that which is before him for every philosopher is ignorant of what his neighbor does ay and of what he does himself and is ignorant of what they both are whether beasts or men those people who find Sebon's arguments too weak, that are ignorant of nothing, that govern the world, that know all. Quae mare compescant causae, quid temperet anum, stellae sponte sua, usawe vagentur et erent, quid premat obscurum lunae, quid proferat orbem, quid velit et posit rerum concordia discors what governs ocean's tides and through the various year the seasons guides whether the stars by their own proper force or foreign power pursue their wandering course why shadows darken the pale queen of night whence she renews her orb and spreads her light what nature's jarring sympathy can mean have they not sometimes in their writings sounded the difficulties they have met with of knowing their own being we see very well that the finger moves that the foot moves that some parts assume a voluntary motion of themselves without our consent and that others work by our direction that one sort of apprehension occasions blushing another paleness such an imagination works upon the spleen only another upon the brain one occasions laughter another tears another stupefies and astonishes all our senses and arrests the motion of all our members at one object the stomach will rise at another a member that lies something lower but how a spiritual impression should make such a breach into a massy and solid subject and the nature of the connection and contexture of these admirable springs and movements never yet man knew omnia incerterationi et in naturae majestate abdita all uncertain in reason and concealed in the majesty of nature says pliny and saint augustine modus quo corporibus adhirent spiritus omninu mirus est nec comprehendi ab homine potest et hoc ipse homo est the manner whereby souls adhere to bodies is altogether wonderful and cannot be conceived by man and yet this is man and yet it is not so much as doubted for the opinions of men are received according to the ancient belief by authority and upon trust as if it were religion and law tis received as gibberish which is commonly spoken this truth with all its clutter of arguments and proofs is admitted as a firm and solid body that is no more to be shaken no more to be judged of on the contrary every one according to the best of his talent corroborates and fortifies this received belief with the utmost power of his reason which is a supple utensil pliable and to be accommodated to any figure and thus the world comes to be filled with lies and fopperies the reason that men doubt of diverse things is that they never examine common impressions they do not dig to the root where the faults and defects lie they only debate upon the branches 
they do not examine whether such and such a thing be true, but if it has been so and so understood. It is not inquired into whether Galen has said anything to purpose, but whether he has said so or so. In truth, it was very good reason that this curb to the liberty of our judgments and that tyranny over our opinions should be extended to the schools and arts. The god of scholastic knowledge is Aristotle. Tis irreligion to question any of his decrees, as it was those of Lycurgus at Sparta. His doctrine is a magisterial law, which, peradventure, is as false as another. I do not know why I should not as willingly embrace either the ideas of Plato, or the atoms of Epicurus, or the plenum or vacuum of Leucippus and Democritus, or the water of Thales, or the infinity of nature of Anaximander, or the air of Diogenes, or the numbers and symmetry of Pythagoras, or the infinity of Parmenides, or the one of Musaeus, or the water and fire of Apollodorus, or the similar parts of Anaxagoras, or the discord and friendship of Empedocles, or the fire of Heraclitus, or any other opinion of that infinite confusion of opinions and determinations which this fine human reason produces by its certitude and clear-sightedness in everything it meddles withal, as I should the opinion of Aristotle upon this subject of the principles of natural things, which principles he builds of three pieces, matter, form, and privation. And what can be more vain than to make inanity itself the cause of the production of things? Privation is a negative. Of what humor could he then make the cause and original of things that are? And yet that were not to be controverted but for the exercise of logic. There is nothing disputed therein to bring it into doubt but to defend the author of the school from foreign objections. His authority is the non ultra, beyond which it is not permitted to inquire. It is very easy upon approved foundations to build whatever we please, for according to the law and ordering of this beginning, the other parts of the structure are easily carried on without any failure. By this way we find our reason well grounded and discourse at a venture, for our masters prepossess and gain beforehand as much room in our belief as is necessary towards concluding afterwards what they please, as geometricians do by their granted demands, the consent and approbation we allow them giving them wherewith to draw us to the right and left, and to whirl us about at their pleasure. Whatever springs from these presuppositions is our master and our God. He will take the level of his foundations so ample and so easy that by them he may mount us up to the clouds, if he so please. In this practice and negotiation of science we have taken the saying of pythagoras that every expert person ought to be believed in his own art for current pay the logician refers the signification of words to the grammarians the rhetorician borrows the state of arguments from the logician the poet his measure from the musician the geometrician his proportions from the arithmetician, and the metaphysicians take physical conjectures for their foundations. For every science has its principle presupposed, by which human judgment is everywhere kept in check. 
if you come to rush against the bar where the principal error lies, they have presently this sentence in their mouths, that there is no disputing with persons who deny principles. Now men can have no principles if not revealed to them by the divinity. Of all the rest, the beginning, the middle, and the end is nothing but dream and vapour. To those that contend upon presupposition we must, on the contrary, presuppose to them the same axiom upon which the dispute is. For every human presupposition and declaration has as much authority one as another, if reason do not make the difference. Wherefore they are all to be put into the balance, and first the generals and those that tyrannize over us. The persuasion of certainty is a certain testimony of folly and extreme incertainty, and there are not a more foolish sort of men, nor that are less philosophers, than the philodoxes of Plato. We must inquire whether fire be hot, whether snow be white, if there be any such things as hard or soft within our knowledge. And as to those answers of which they make old stories, as he that doubted if there was any such thing as heat, whom they bid throw himself into the fire, and he that denied the coldness of ice, whom they bid to put ice into his bosom. They are pitiful things, unworthy of the profession of philosophy. If they had let us alone in our natural being to receive the appearance of things without us, according as they present themselves to us by our senses, and had permitted us to follow our own natural appetites, governed by the condition of our birth, they might then have reason to talk at that rate. But tis from them we have learned to make ourselves judges of the world. Tis from them that we derive this fancy, that human reason is controller general of all that is without and within the roof of heaven that comprehends everything, that can do everything, by the means of which everything is known and understood. This answer would be good among the cannibals, who enjoy the happiness of a long, quiet, and peaceable life without Aristotle's precepts, and without the knowledge of the name of physics. This answer would perhaps be of more value and greater force than all those they borrow from their reason and invention. Of this all animals, and all where the power of the law of nature is yet pure and simple, would be as capable as we, but as for them, they have renounced it. They need not tell us, it is true for you to see and feel it to be so. They must tell me whether I really feel what I think I do, and if I do feel it, they must then tell me why I feel it, and how, and what. Let them tell me the name, original, the parts and junctures of heat and cold, the qualities of the agent and patient, or let them give up their profession, which is not to admit or approve of anything but by the way of reason. That is their test in all sorts of essays, but certainly tis a test full of falsity, error, weakness, and defect. Which way can we better prove it than by itself? If we are not to believe her when speaking of herself, she can hardly be thought fit to judge of foreign things. If she know anything, it must at least be her own being and abode. She is in the soul, and either a part or an effect of it, for true and essential reason, from which we by a false color borrow the name, 
is lodged in the bosom of the Almighty. There is her habitation and recess. Tis thence that she imparts her rays, when God is pleased to impart any beam of it to mankind, as Pallas issued from her father's head to communicate herself to the world. Now let us see what human reason tells us of herself and of the soul, not of the soul in general, of which almost all philosophy makes the celestial and first bodies participants, nor of that which Thales attributed to things which themselves are reputed inanimate, led thereto by the consideration of the lodestone, but of that which appertains to us, and that we ought the best to know. Ignoratur enim quae sit natura animae, nata sit, an contra nascentibus insinuetur, et simul intereat nobiscum morte diremta, an tenebris orci visat vastasque lacunas, an pecudes alias divinitus insinuet se. For none the nature of the soul doth know, whether that it be born with us or no, or be infused into us at our birth, and dies with us when we return to earth or then descends to the black shades below, or into other animals does go. Crates and Dicaearchus were of opinion that there was no soul at all, but that the body thus stirs by a natural motion. Plato, that it was a substance moving of itself. Thales, a nature without repose. Asclepiades, an exercising of the senses, Hesiod and Anaximander, a thing composed of earth and water, Parmenides, of earth and fire, Empedocles, of blood. Sanguineam vomit ille animam. He vomits up his bloody soul. Posidonius, Cleanthes, and Galen, that it was heat or a hot complexion. Igneus est oles vigor et calestis origo. Their vigor of fire and of heavenly race. Hippocrates, a spirit diffused all over the body. Varro, that it was an air received at the mouth, heated in the lungs, moistened in the heart, and diffused throughout the whole body. Zeno, the quintessence of the four elements. Heraclides Ponticus, that it was the light. Xenocrates and the Egyptians, a mobile number. The Chaldeans, a virtue without any determinate form. Habitum quem dam vitalem corporis essa harmoniam graeci quam dicunt a certain vital habit in man's frame which harmony the grecian sages name let us not forget aristotle who held the soul to be that which naturally causes the body to move which he calls entelechia with as cold an invention as any of the rest for he neither speaks of the essence nor of the original, nor of the nature of the soul, but only takes notice of the effect. Lactantius, Seneca, and most of the dogmatists have confessed that it was a thing they did not understand. After all this enumeration of opinions, Harum sententiarum quo vera sit, Deus aliquis viderit, of these opinions, which is the true, let some god determine, says Cicero. I know by myself, says St. Bernard, how incomprehensible God is, seeing I cannot comprehend the parts of my own being. Heraclitus, who was of opinion that every being was full of souls and demons, 
did nevertheless maintain that no one could advance so far towards the knowledge of the soul as ever to arrive at it, so profound was the essence of it. Neither is there less controversy and debate about seating of it. Hippocrates and Hierophilus place it in the ventricle of the brain. Democritus and Aristotle throughout the whole body. Ut bona saepe valetudo cum dicitur esse corporis et non est tamen haec pars ulla valentis. As when the body's health they do it call, when of a sound man that's no part at all. Epicurus in the stomach. Hic exultat enim pavor ac metus, haec loca circum laetitiae mulcent. For this the seat of horror is and fear, and joys in turn do likewise triumph here. The Stoics about and within the heart, Aristratus adjoining the membrane of the epicranium, Empedocles in the blood, as also Moses, which was the reason why he interdicted eating the blood of beasts, because the soul is there seated. Galen thought that every part of the body had its soul. Strato has placed it betwixt the eyebrows. Qua facia quidem sit animus, aut ubi habitet, ne quirendum quidem est, what figure the soul is of, or what part it inhabits, is not to be inquired into, says Cicero. I very willingly deliver this author to you in his own words, for should I alter eloquence itself? Besides, it were but a poor prize to steal the matter of his inventions. They are neither very frequent, nor of any great weight, and sufficiently known. But the reason why Chrysippus argues it to be about the heart, as all the rest of that sect do, is not to be omitted. It is, says he, because when we would affirm any things, we lay our hand upon our breasts, and when we would pronounce ego, which signifies I, we let the lower jaw fall towards the stomach. This place ought not to be passed over without a remark upon the vanity of so great a man. For besides that these considerations are infinitely light in themselves, the last is only a proof to the Greeks that they have their souls lodged in that part. No human judgment is so sprightly and vigilant that it does not sometimes sleep. Why do we fear to say? The Stoics, the fathers of human prudence, think that the soul of a man, crushed under a ruin, long labors and strives to get out, like a mouse caught in a trap, before it can disengage itself from the burden some hold that the world was made to give bodies by way of punishment to the spirits fallen by their own fault from the purity wherein they had been created the first creation having been incorporeal and that according as they are more or less depraved from their spirituality so are they more or less jocundly or dully incorporated and that thence proceeds all the variety of so much created matter. But the spirit that for his punishment was invested with the body of the sun must certainly have a very rare and particular measure of change. End of section 47 Section 48 of Essays, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. Essays, Book Two, by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Apology for Raymond Sebon. Part Eight. The extremities of our perquisition do all fall into astonishment and blindness. As Plutarch says of the testimony of histories, that according to charts and maps, the utmost bounds of known countries are taken up with marshes, impenetrable forests, deserts, and uninhabitable places. This is the reason why the most gross and childish ravings were most found in those authors who treat of the most elevated subjects and proceed the furthest in them, losing themselves in their own curiosity and presumption. The beginning and end of knowledge are equally foolish. Observe to what a pitch Plato flies in his poetic clouds. Do but take notice there of the gibberish of the gods. But what did he dream of when he defined a man to be a two-legged animal without feathers, giving those who had a mind to deride him a pleasant occasion for having pulled a capon alive, they went about calling it the man of Plato. And what did the Epicureans think of, out of what simplicity did they first imagine that their atoms, that they said were bodies having some weight and a natural motion downwards, had made the world, till they were put in mind by their adversaries, that, according to this description, it was impossible they should unite and join to one another, their fall being so direct and perpendicular, and making so many parallel lines throughout. Wherefore there was a necessity that they should since add a fortuitous and sideways motion, and that they should, moreover, accoutre their atoms with hooked tails, by which they might unite and cling to one another. And even then do not those that attack them upon this second consideration put them hardly to it? If the atoms have by chance formed so many sorts of figures, why did it never fall out that they made a house or a shoe? Why, at the same rate, should we not believe that an infinite number of Greek letters, strewed all over a certain place, might fall into the contexture of the Iliad? Whatever is capable of reason, says Zeno, is better than that which is not capable. There is nothing better than the world. The world is therefore capable of reason. Cotta, by this way of argumentation, makes the world a mathematician. And tis also made a musician and an organist by this other argumentation of Zeno. The whole is more than a part. We are capable of wisdom and are part of the world. Therefore, the world is wise. There are infinite like examples, not only of arguments that are false in themselves, but silly ones that do not hold in themselves, and that accuse their authors not so much of ignorance as imprudence, in the reproaches the philosophers dash one another in the teeth withal, upon their dissensions in their sects and opinions. Whoever should bundle up a lusty faggot of the fooleries of human wisdom would produce wonders. 
I willingly muster up these few for a pattern, by a certain meaning not less profitable to consider than the most sound and moderate instructions. Let us judge by these what opinion we are to have of man, of his sense and reason, when in these great persons that have raised human knowledge so high, so many gross mistakes and manifest errors are to be found. For my part, I am apt to believe that they have treated of knowledge casually and like a toy, with both hands, and have contended about reason as of a vain and frivolous instrument, setting on foot all sorts of fancies and inventions, sometimes more sinewy and sometimes weaker. This same Plato, who defines man as if he were a cock, says elsewhere, after Socrates, that he does not, in truth, know what man is, and that he is a member of the world the hardest to understand. By this variety and instability of opinions they tacitly lead us, as it were by the hand, to this resolution of their irresolution. They profess not always to deliver their opinions barefaced and apparent to us. They have one while disguised them in the fabulous shadows of poetry, and at another in some other visor, for our imperfection carries this also along with it, that crude meat is not always proper for our stomachs. We must dry, alter, and mix it. They do the same. They sometimes conceal their real opinions and judgments, and falsify them to accommodate themselves to the public use. They will not make an open profession of ignorance and of the imbecility of human reason, that they may not fright children, but they sufficiently discover it to us under the appearance of a troubled and inconstant science. I advised a person in Italy, who had a great mind to speak Italian, that, provided he only had a desire to make himself understood, without being ambitious in any other respect to excel, that he should only make use of the first word that came to the tongue's end, whether Latin, French, Spanish, or Gascon, and that by adding the Italian termination, he could not fail of hitting upon some idiom of the country, either Tuscan, Roman, Venetian, Piedmontese, or Neapolitan, and so fall in with some one of those many forms. I say the same of philosophy. She has so many faces, so much variety, and has said, so many things, that all our dreams and ravings are there to be found. Human fancy can conceive nothing good or bad that is not there. Nihil tam absurde dici potest quod non dicatur ab aliquo philosophorum. Nothing can be said so absurd that has not been said before by some of the philosophers. And I am the more willing to expose my whimsies to the public, for as much as though they are spun out of myself and without any pattern, I know they will be found related to some ancient humor, and some will not stick to say, see whence he took it. My manners are natural. I have not called in the assistance of any discipline to erect them, but, weak as they are, when it came into my head to lay them open to the world's view, and that to expose them to the light in a little more decent garb, 
I went to adorn them with reasons and examples. It was a wonder to myself, accidentally to find them conformable to so many philosophical discourses and examples. I never knew what regimen my life was of till it was near worn out and spent. A new figure, an unpremeditated and accidental philosopher. But to return to the soul, inasmuch as Plato has placed reason in the brain, anger in the heart, and concupiscence in the liver, tis likely that it was rather an interpretation of the movements of the soul than that he intended a division and separation of it, as of a body, into several members and the most likely of their opinions is that tis always a soul, that by its faculty reasons, remembers, comprehends, judges, desires, and exercises all its other operations by diverse instruments of the body. As the pilot guides his ship according to his experience, one while straining or slacking the cordage, one while hoisting the mainyard or removing the rudder, by one and the same power carrying on several effects. And that it is lodged in the brain, which appears in that the wounds and accidents that touch that part do immediately offend the faculties of the soul and tis not incongruous that it should thence diffuse itself through the other parts of the body. Medium non deserit unquam celi fibus iter, radiis tamen omnia lustrat. Phoebus ne'er deviates from the zodiac's way, yet all things doth illustrate with his ray. As the sun sheds from heaven its light and influence, and fills the world with them. Ketera pars animae per totum dissita corpus, paret et ad numen mentis nomenque muetur. The other part of the soul diffused all o'er, the body does obey the reason's lore. Some have said that there was a general soul, as it were a great body, whence all the particular souls were extracted, and thither again return, always restoring themselves to that universal matter. Deum namque ire per omnes, terasque tractusque maris celumque profundum, hinc pecudes, armenta, viros, Genus omne ferarum, quemque sibi tenues nascentum arcesere vitas, scilicet huc redi de inde, ac resoluta referi, omnia nec morti esse locum. For God goes forth and spreads throughout the whole, heaven, earth, and sea, the universal soul, each at its birth from him all beings share both man and brute the breath of vital air to him return and loosed from earthly chain fly whence they sprung and rest in god again spurn at the grave and fearless of decay dwell in high heaven and star the ethereal way others that they only rejoined and reunited themselves to it, others that they were produced from the divine substance, others by the angels of fire and air, others that they were from all antiquity, and some that they were created at the very point of time the bodies wanted them, Others make them to descend from the orb of the moon and return thither. 
the generality of the ancients believed that they were begotten from father to son after a like manner and produced with all other natural things taking their argument from the likeness of children to their fathers instillata patris virtus tibi fortes creantur fortibus et bonis thou hast thy father's virtues with his blood for still the brave spring from the brave and good and that we see descend from fathers to their children not only bodily marks but moreover a resemblance of humours complexions and inclinations of the soul denique cur acris violentia triste leonum seminium sequitur dolus vulpibus et fuga cervis a patribus datur et patrius pavor incitat artus si non certa suo quia semine seminioque vis animi pariter crescit cum corpore toto for why should rage from the fierce lion's seed or from the subtle fox's craft proceed or why the timorous and flying heart his fear and trembling to his race impart but that a certain force of mind does grow and still increases as the bodies do that thereupon the divine justice is grounded punishing in the children the faults of their fathers forasmuch as the contagion of paternal vices is in some sort imprinted in the soul of children and that the ill government of their will extends to them moreover that if souls had any other derivation than a natural consequence and that they had been some other thing out of the body they would retain some memory of their first being the natural faculties that are proper to them of discoursing reasoning and remembering being considered si in corpus nascentibus insinuatur cur superante actam aetatem meminisse nequimus nec vestigia gestarum rerum ulla tenemus for at our birth if it infused be why do we then retain no memory of our foregoing life and why no more remember anything we did before for to make the condition of our souls such as we would have it to be we must suppose them all-knowing even in their natural simplicity and purity by these means they had been such being free from the prison of the body as well before they entered into it as we hope they shall be after they are gone out of it and from this knowledge it should follow that they should remember being got in the body as plato said that what we learn is no other than a remembrance of what we knew before a thing which every one by experience may maintain to be false for as much in the first place as that we do not justly remember anything but what we have been taught and that if the memory did purely perform its office it would at least suggest to us something more than what we have learned secondly that which she knew being in her purity was a true knowledge knowing things as they are by her divine intelligence whereas here we make her receive falsehood and vice when we instruct her wherein she cannot employ her reminiscence that image and conception having never been planted in her to say that the corporal prison does in such sort suffocate her natural faculties that they are there utterly extinct 
is first contrary to this other belief of acknowledging her power to be so great and the operations of it that men sensibly perceive in this life so admirable as to have thereby concluded that divinity and eternity past and the immortality to come nam si tanto pere est animi mutata potestas omnis ut actarum exciderit retinentia rerum non ut opinor ea ab leto iam longior erat for if the mind be changed to that degree as of things past to lose all memory so great a change as that i must confess appears to me than death but little less furthermore tis here with us and not elsewhere that the force and effects of the soul ought to be considered all the rest of her perfections are vain and useless to her tis by her present condition that all her immortality is to be rewarded and paid and of the life of man only that she is to render an account it had been injustice to have stripped her of her means and powers to have disarmed her in order in the time of her captivity and imprisonment in the flesh of her weakness and infirmity in the time wherein she was forced and compelled to pass an infinite and perpetual sentence and condemnation and to insist upon the consideration of so short a time peradventure but an hour or two or at the most but a century which has no more proportion with infinity than an instant in this momentary interval to ordain and definitively to determine of her whole being it were an unreasonable disproportion too to assign an eternal recompense in consequence of so short a life plato to defend himself from this inconvenience will have future payments limited to the term of a hundred years relatively to human duration and of us ourselves there are enough who have given them temporal limits by this they judged that the generation of the soul followed the common condition of human things as also her life according to the opinion of epicurus and democritus which has been the most received in consequence of these fine appearances that they saw it born and that according as the body grew more capable they saw it increase in vigor as the other did that its feebleness in infancy was very manifest and in time its better strength and maturity and after that its declension and old age and at last its decrepitude gigni pariter cum corpore et una crescere centimus pariterque senescere mentem souls with the bodies to be born we may discern with them to increase with them decay they perceived it to be capable of diverse passions and agitated with diverse painful motions whence it fell into lassitude and uneasiness capable of alteration and change of cheerfulness of stupidity and languor and subject to diseases and injuries as the stomach or the foot mentem sanari corpus ut aigrum cernimus et flecti medicina posse videmus sick minds as well as bodies we do see by medicine's virtue oft restored to be dazzled and intoxicated with the fumes of wine jostled from her seat by the vapours of a burning fever 
laid asleep by the application of some medicaments and roused by others corpoream naturam animi esse necessa est corporeis quoniam telis ictuque laborat there must be of necessity we find a nature that's corporeal of the mind because we evidently see it smarts and wounded is with shafts the body darts they saw it astonished and overthrown in all its faculties through the mere bite of a mad dog and in that condition to have no stability of reason no sufficiency no virtue no philosophical resolution no resistance that could exempt it from the subjection of such accidents the slaver of a contemptible cur shed upon the hand of socrates to shake all his wisdom and all his great and regulated imaginations and so to annihilate them and that there remained no trace of his former knowledge Vis animae conturbatur et divisa seorsum, disiectatur eodem illo distracta veneno. The power of the soul's disturbed, and when that once is but sequestered from her, then by the same poison tis dispersed abroad. And this poison to find no more resistance in that great soul than in an infant of four years old a poison sufficient to make all philosophy if it were incarnate become furious and mad insomuch that cato who ever disdained death and fortune could not endure the sight of a looking-glass or of water overwhelmed with horror and affright at the thought of falling by the contagion of a mad dog into the disease called by physicians hydrophobia vis morbi distracta per artus turbat agens animam spumantes aequare salso ventorum ut validis verwescunt viribus undae throughout the limbs diffused the fierce disease disturbs the soul as in the briny seas the foaming waves to swell and boil we see stirred by the wind's impetuosity now as to this particular philosophy has sufficiently armed man to encounter all other accidents either with patience or if the search of that costs too dear by an infallible defeat in totally depriving himself of all sentiment but these are expedients that are only of use to a soul being itself and in its full power capable of reason and deliberation but not at all proper for this inconvenience where in a philosopher the soul becomes the soul of a madman troubled overturned and lost which many occasions may produce as a too vehement agitation that any violent passion of the soul may beget in itself or a wound in a certain part of the person or vapours from the stomach any of which may stupefy the understanding and turn the brain morbis in corporis avius erat saepe animus dementit enim deliraque fatur interdumque gravi letargo fertur in altum aeturnumque soporem oculis nutuque cadenti for when the body's sick and ill at ease the mind doth often share in the disease wonders grows wild and raves and sometimes by a heavy and a stupid lethargy is overcome and cast into a deep a most profound and everlasting 
sleep. The philosophers, methinks, have not much touched this string, no more than another of equal importance. They have this dilemma continually in their mouths to console our mortal condition. The soul is either mortal or immortal. If mortal, it will suffer no pain. If immortal, it will change for the better. They never touch the other branch. What if she change for the worse? And leave to the poets the menaces of future torments. But thereby they make themselves a good game. These are two omissions that I often meet with in their discourses. I return to the first. This soul loses the use of the sovereign stoical good, so constant and so firm. Our fine human wisdom must here yield and give up her arms. As to the rest, they also considered, by the vanity of human reason, that the mixture and association of two so contrary things as the mortal and the immortal was unimaginable. Quippe et enim mortale aeterno jungere et una consentire putare et fungi mutua posse, desipere est, quid enim deversius esse putandum est, aut magis inter se disjunctum discrepitansque, quam mortale quod est, immortale atque pereni junctum in concilio saevas tolerare procellas. The mortal and the eternal then to blend, and think they can pursue one common end, is madness, for what things more different are, distinct in nature and disposed to jar. How can it then be thought that these should bear, when thus conjoined, of harms an equal share? Moreover, they perceived the soul tending towards death as well as the body. Simul aivo fessa fatiscit, fatigued together with the weight of years. Which, according to Zeno, the image of sleep does sufficiently demonstrate to us, for he looks upon it as a fainting and fall of the soul as well as of the body. Contra hi animum et quasi labi putat atque concidere. And what they perceived in some, that the soul maintained its force and vigor to the last gasp of life, they attributed to the variety of diseases, as it is observable in men at the last extremity, that some retain one sense and some another, one the hearing and another the smell, without any manner of defect or alteration, and that there is not so universal a deprivation that some parts do not remain vigorous and entire. Non aleo pacto quam si pes cum dolet aigri, in nullo caput interea sit forte dolore. So often of the gout a man complains, whose head is at the same time free from pains. The sight of our judgment is, to truth, the same that the owl's eyes are to the splendor of the sun, says Aristotle. By what can we better convince him than by so gross blindness in so apparent a light? For the contrary opinion of the immortality of the soul, which Cicero says was first introduced, according to the testimony of books at least, by Ferecides Sirius in the time of King Tullus, though some attribute it to Thales, and others to others. Tis the part of human science that is treated of with the greatest doubt and reservation. The most positive 
dogmatists are fain in this point principally to fly to the refuge of the academy no one doubts what aristotle has established upon this subject no more than all the ancients in general who handle it with a wavering belief rem gratissimam promittentium magis quam probantium a thing more acceptable in the promisers than the provers he conceals himself in clouds of words of difficult unintelligible sense and has left to those of his sect as great a dispute about his judgment as about the matter itself two things rendered this opinion plausible to them one that without the immortality of souls there would be nothing whereon to ground the vain hopes of glory which is a consideration of wonderful repute in the world the other that it is a very profitable impression as plato says that vices when they escape the discovery and cognizance of human justice are still within the reach of the divine which will pursue them even after the death of the guilty man is excessively solicitous to prolong his being and has to the utmost of his power provided for it there are monuments for the conservation of the body and glory to preserve the name he has employed all his wit and opinion to the rebuilding of himself impatient of his fortune and to prop himself by his inventions the soul by reason of its anxiety and impotence being unable to stand by itself wanders up and down to seek out consolations hopes and foundations and alien circumstances to which she adheres and fixes and how light or fantastic soever invention delivers them to her relies more willingly and with greater assurance upon them than upon herself but tis wonderful to observe how the most constant and obstinate maintainers of this just and clear persuasion of the immortality of the soul fall short and how weak their arguments are when they go about to prove it by human reason somnia sunt non docentis sed optantis they are dreams not of the teacher but wisher says one of the ancients by which testimony man may know that he owes the truth he himself finds out to fortune and accident since that even then when it is fallen into his hand he has not wherewith to hold and maintain it and that his reason has not force to make use of it all things produced by our own meditation and understanding whether true or false are subject to incertitude and controversy twas for the chastisement of our pride and for the instruction of our miserable condition and incapacity that god wrought the perplexity and confusion of the tower of babel whatever we undertake without his assistance whatever we see without the lamp of his grace is but vanity and folly we corrupt the very essence of truth which is uniform and constant by our weakness when fortune puts it into our possession what course soever man takes of himself god still permits it to come to the same confusion the image whereof he so lively represents to us in the just chastisement wherewith he crushed nimrod's presumption 
and frustrated the vain attempt of his proud structure perdam sapientiam sapientium et prudentiam prudentium reprobabo i will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent the diversity of idioms and tongues with which he disturbed this work what are they other than this infinite and perpetual alteration and discordance of opinions and reasons which accompany and confound the vain building of human wisdom and to very good effect too for what would hold us if we had but the least grain of knowledge this saint has very much obliged me ipsa utilitatis occultatio aut humilitatis exercitatio est aut elationis attritio the very concealment of the truth is either an exercise of humility or a quelling of presumption to what a pitch of presumption and insolence do we raise our blindness and folly but to return to my subject it was truly very good reason that we should be beholden to god only and to the favour of his grace for the truth of so noble a belief since from his sole bounty we receive the fruit of immortality which consists in the enjoyment of eternal beatitude let us ingenuously confess that god alone has dictated it to us and faith for tis no lesson of nature and our own reason and whoever will inquire into his own being and power both within and without without this divine privilege whoever shall consider man impartially and without flattery will see in him no efficacy or faculty that relishes of anything but death and earth the more we give and confess to owe and render to god we do it with the greater christianity that which this stoic philosopher says he holds from the fortuitous consent of the popular voice had it not been better that he had held it from god cum de animarum aeternitate disserimus non leve momentum apud nos habet consensus hominum aut timentium inferos aut colentium utor hac publica persuasione when we discourse of the immortality of souls the consent of men that either fear or adore the infernal powers is of no small advantage i make use of this public persuasion now the weakness of human arguments upon this subject is particularly manifested by the fabulous circumstances they have superadded as consequences of this opinion to find out of what condition this immortality of ours was let us omit the stoics usuram nobis largiuntur tanquam cornicibus dio mansuros aiunt animos semper negant they give us a long life as also they do to crows they say our soul shall continue long but that it shall continue always they deny who give to souls a life after this but finite the most universal and received fancy and that continues down to our times in various places is that of which they make pythagoras the author not that he was the original inventor 
but because it received a great deal of weight and repute by the authority of his approbation that souls at their departure out of us did nothing but shift from one body to another from a lion to a horse from a horse to a king continually travelling at this rate from habitation to habitation and he himself said that he remembered he had been italides since that euphorbus afterwards hermotimus and finally from pyrrhus was passed into pythagoras having a memory of himself of two hundred and six years and some have added that these very souls sometimes mount up to heaven and come down again o pater ane aliquas ad celum hinc ire putandam est sublimes animas iterumque ad tarda reverti corpora quae lucis miseris tam dira cupido o father is it then to be conceived that any of these spirits so sublime should hence to the celestial regions climb and thence return to earth to reassume their sluggish bodies rotting in a tomb for wretched life whence does such fondness come origen makes them eternally to go and come from a better to a worse estate the opinion that varro mentions is that after four hundred and forty years revolution they should be reunited to their first bodies chrysippus held that this would happen after a certain space of time unknown and unlimited plato who professes to have embraced this belief from pindar and the ancient poets that we are to undergo infinite vicissitudes of mutation for which the soul is prepared having neither punishment nor reward in the other world but what is temporal as its life here is but temporal concludes that it has a singular knowledge of the affairs of heaven of hell of the world through all which it has passed, repassed, and made stay in several voyages, are matters for her memory. Observe her progress elsewhere. The soul that has lived well is reunited to the stars to which it is assigned. That which has lived ill removes into a woman, and if it do not there reform, is again removed into a beast of condition suitable to its vicious manners and shall see no end of its punishments till it be returned to its natural constitution and that it has by the force of reason purged itself from those gross stupid and elementary qualities it was polluted with but i will not omit the objection the epicureans make against this transmigration from one body to another tis a pleasant one they ask what expedient would be found out if the number of the dying should chance to be greater than that of those who are coming into the world for the souls turned out of their old habitation would scuffle and crowd which should first get possession of their new lodging. And they further demand, how shall they pass away their time whilst waiting till new quarters are made ready for them? Or, on the contrary, if more animals should be born than die, the body, they say, would be but in an ill condition whilst waiting for a soul to be infused into it and it would fall out that some bodies would die before they had been alive denique conubia ad veneris partusque ferarum 
esse animas praesto de ridiculum esse videtur et spectare immortales mortalia membra in numero numero certareque prae properanter inter se quae prima potissimaque insinuetur absurd to think that whilst wild beasts beget or bear their young a thousand souls do wait expect the falling body fight and strive which first shall enter in and make it live others have arrested the soul in the body of the deceased with it to animate serpents worms and other beasts which are said to be bred out of the corruption of our members and even out of our ashes others divide them into two parts the one mortal the other immortal others make it corporeal and nevertheless immortal some make it immortal without sense or knowledge there are others even among ourselves who have believed that devils were made of the souls of the damned as plutarch thinks that gods were made of those that were saved for there are few things which that author is so positive in as he is in this maintaining elsewhere a doubtful and ambiguous way of expression we are told says he and steadfastly should believe that the souls of virtuous men both according to nature and the divine justice become saints and from saints demigods and from demigods after they are perfectly as in sacrifices of purgation cleansed and purified being delivered from all passibility and all mortality they become not by any civil decree but in real truth and according to all probability of reason entire and perfect gods in receiving a most happy and glorious end but who desires to see him him who is yet the most sober and moderate of the whole gang of philosophers lay about him with greater boldness and relate his miracles upon this subject i refer him to his treatise of the moon and of the demon of socrates where he may as evidently as in any other place whatever satisfy himself that the mysteries of philosophy have many strange things in common with those of poetry human understanding losing itself in attempting to sound and search all things to the bottom even as we tired and worn out with a long course of life return to infancy and dotage see here the fine and certain instructions which we extract from human knowledge concerning the soul neither is there less temerity in what they teach us touching our corporal parts let us choose out one or two examples for otherwise we should lose ourselves in this vast and troubled ocean of medical errors let us first know whether at least they agree about the matter whereof men produce one another for as to their first production it is no wonder if in a thing so high and so long since past human understanding finds itself puzzled and perplexed archelaus the physician whose disciple and favorite socrates was according to aristoxenos said that both men and beasts were made of a lacteous slime expressed by the heat of the earth pythagoras says that our seed is the foam or cream 
of our better blood plato that it is the distillation of the marrow of the backbone raising his argument from this that that part is first sensible of being weary of the work alcmaeon that it is part of the substance of the brain and that it is so says he is proved by the weakness of the eyes in those who are immoderate in that exercise democritus that it is a substance extracted from the whole mass of the body epicurus an extract from soul and body aristotle an excrement drawn from the aliment of the blood the last which is diffused over our members others that it is a blood concocted and digested by the heat of the genitals which they judge by reason that in excessive endeavours a man voids pure blood wherein there seems to be more likelihood could a man extract any appearance from so infinite a confusion now to bring this seed to do its work how many contrary opinions do they set on foot aristotle and democritus are of opinion that women have no sperm and that tis nothing but a sweat that they distil in the heat of pleasure and motion and that contributes nothing at all to generation galen on the contrary and his followers believe that without the concurrence of seeds there can be no generation here are the physicians the philosophers the lawyers and divines by the ears with our wives about the dispute for what term women carry their fruit and i for my part by the example of myself stick with those that maintain a woman goes eleven months with child the world is built upon this experience there is no so commonplace a woman that cannot give her judgment in all these controversies and yet we cannot agree end of section 48section 49 of essays book 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by cynthia moyer essays book 2 by michel de montaigne translated by charles cotton apology for raymond sebon part nine here is enough to verify that man is no better instructed in the knowledge of himself in his corporal than in his spiritual part we have proposed himself to himself and his reason to his reason to see what she could say i think i have sufficiently demonstrated how little she understands herself in herself and who understands not himself in himself in what can he quasi vero mensuram ulius rei posset agere qui sui nesciat as if he could understand the measure of any other thing that knows not his own in earnest protagoras told us a pretty flam in making man the measure of all things that never knew so much as his own and if it be not he his dignity will not permit that any other creature should have this advantage 
now he being so contrary in himself and one judgment so incessantly subverting another this favourable proposition was but a mockery which induced us necessarily to conclude the nullity of the compass and the compasser when thales reputes the knowledge of man very difficult for man to comprehend he at the same time gives him to understand that all other knowledge is impossible you note the author as we have already mentioned is addressing margaret de valois End note for whom i have taken the pains contrary to my custom to write so long a discourse will not refuse to support your c'est bon by the ordinary forms of arguing wherewith you are every day instructed and in this will exercise both your wit and learning for this last fencing trick is never to be made use of but as an extreme remedy tis a desperate thrust wherein you are to quit your own arms to make your adversary abandon his and a secret slight which must be very rarely and then very reservedly put in practice tis great temerity to lose yourself that you may destroy another you must not die to be revenged as gobrias did for being closely grappled in combat with a lord of persia darius coming in sword in hand and fearing to strike lest he should kill gobrias he called out to him boldly to fall on though he should run them both through at once i have known desperate weapons and conditions of single combat and wherein he that offered them put himself and his adversary upon terms of inevitable death to them both censured for unjust the portuguese in the indian sea took certain turks prisoners who impatient of their captivity resolved and it succeeded by striking the nails of the ship one against another and making a spark to fall into the barrels of powder that were set in the place where they were guarded to blow up and reduce themselves their masters and the vessel to ashes we here touch the outplate and utmost limits of sciences wherein the extremity is vicious as in virtue keep yourselves in the common road it is not good to be so subtle and cunning remember the tuscan proverb qui troppo sa sottilia si scavezza who makes himself too wise becomes a fool i advise you that in all your opinions and discourses as well as in your manners and all other things you keep yourself moderate and temperate and avoid novelty i am an enemy to all extravagant ways you who by the authority of your grandeur and yet more by the advantages which those qualities give you that are more your own may with the twinkle of an eye command whom you please ought to have given this charge to some one who made profession of letters who might after a better manner have proved and illustrated these things to you but here is as much as you will stand in need of epicurus said of the laws that the worst were so necessary for us that without them men would devour one another and plato affirms that without laws we should live like beasts our wit is a wandering dangerous and temerarious utensil it is hard to couple any order or measure to it 
in those of our own time who are endued with any rare excellence above others or any extraordinary vivacity of understanding we see them almost all lash out into licentiousness of opinions and manners and tis almost a miracle to find one temperate and sociable tis all the reason in the world to limit human wit within the strictest limits imaginable in study as in all the rest we ought to have its steps and advances numbered and fixed and that the limits of its inquisition be bounded by art it is curbed and fettered by religions laws customs sciences precepts mortal and immortal penalties and yet we see that it escapes from all these bonds by its volubility and dissolution tis a vain body which has nothing to lay hold on or to seize a various and deform body incapable of being either bound or held in earnest there are few souls so regular firm and well descended as are to be trusted with their own conduct and that can with moderation and without temerity sail in the liberty of their own judgments beyond the common and received opinions tis more expedient to put them under pupilage wit is a dangerous weapon even to the possessor if he knows not how to use it discreetly and there is not a beast to whom a headboard is more justly to be given to keep his looks down and before his feet and to hinder him from wandering here and there out of the tracks which custom and the laws have laid before him and therefore it will be better for you to keep yourself in the beaten path let it be what it will than to fly out at a venture with this unbridled liberty but if any of these new doctors will pretend to be ingenious in your presence at the expense both of your soul and his own to avoid this dangerous plague which is every day laid in your way to infect you this preservative in the extremest necessity will prevent the danger and hinder the contagion of this poison from offending either you or your company the liberty then and frolic forwardness of these ancient wits produced in philosophy and human sciences several sects of different opinions every one undertaking to judge and make choice of what he would stick to and maintain but now that men go all one way qui certis quibustam destinatisque sententiis addicti et consecrati sunt ut etiam quae non probant cogantur defendere who are so tied and obliged to certain opinions that they are bound to defend even those they do not approve and that we receive the arts by civil authority and decree so that the schools have but one pattern and a like circumscribed institution and discipline we no more take notice what the coin weighs and is really worth but every one receives it according to the estimate that common approbation and use puts upon it the alloy is not questioned but how much it is current for in like manner all things pass we take physic as we do geometry and tricks of hocus-pocus enchantments and love spells the correspondence of the souls of the dead prognostications domifications 
and even this ridiculous pursuit of the philosopher's stone all things pass for current pay without any manner of scruple or contradiction we need to know no more but that mars's house is in the middle of the triangle of the hand that of venus in the thumb and that of mercury in the little finger that when the table line cuts the tubercle of the forefinger tis a sign of cruelty that when it falls short of the middle finger and that the natural median line makes an angle with the vital in the same side tis a sign of a miserable death that if in a woman the natural line be open and does not close the angle with the vital this denotes that she shall not be very chaste i leave you to judge whether a man qualified with such knowledge may not pass with reputation and esteem in all companies theophrastus said that human knowledge guided by the senses might judge of the causes of things to a certain degree but that being arrived to first and extreme causes it must stop short and retire by reason either of its own infirmity or the difficulty of things tis a moderate and gentle opinion that our own understandings may conduct us to the knowledge of some things and that it has certain measures of power beyond which tis temerity to employ it this opinion is plausible and introduced by men of well-composed minds but tis hard to limit our wit which is curious and greedy and will no more stop at a thousand than at fifty paces having experimentally found that wherein one has failed the other has hit and that what was unknown to one age the age following has explained and that arts and sciences are not cast in a mould but are formed and perfected by degrees by often handling and polishing as bears leisurely lick their cubs into form what my force cannot discover i do not yet desist to sound and to try and by handling and kneading this new matter over and over again by turning and heating it i lay open to him that shall succeed me a kind of facility to enjoy it more at his ease and make it more maniable and supple for him ut humetia sole cera remolescit tractataque polyce multas vertitur in facies ipsoque fit utilis usu as wax doth softer in the sun become and tempered twixt the finger and the thumb will various forms and several shapes admit till for the present use tis rendered fit as much will the second do for the third which is the cause that the difficulty ought not to make me despair and my own incapacity as little for tis nothing but my own man is as capable of all things as of some and if he confesses as theophrastus says the ignorance of first causes let him at once surrender all the rest of his knowledge if he is defective in foundation his reason is a ground disputation and inquiry have no other aim nor stop but principles if this aim do not stop his career he runs into an infinite irresolution non potest aliud alio magis minusque comprehendi quoniam omnium rerum una est definitio comprehendendi 
one thing can no more or less be comprehended than another because the definition of comprehending all things is the same now tis very likely that if the soul knew anything it would in the first place know itself and if it knew anything out of itself it would be its own body and case before anything else if we see the gods of physic to this very day debating about our anatomy mulciber in troiam pro troia stabat apollo vulcan against for troy apollo stood when are we to expect that they will be agreed we are nearer neighbors to ourselves than whiteness to snow or weight to stones if man do not know himself how should he know his force and functions it is not perhaps that we have not some real knowledge in us but tis by chance for as much as errors are received into our soul by the same way after the same manner and by the same conduct it has not wherewithal to distinguish them nor wherewithal to choose the truth from falsehood the academics admitted a certain partiality of judgment and thought it too crude to say that it was not more likely to say that snow was white than black and that we were no more assured of the motion of a stone thrown by the hand than that of the eighth sphere and to avoid this difficulty and strangeness that can in truth hardly lodge in our imagination though they concluded that we were in no sort capable of knowledge and that truth is engulfed in so profound an abyss as is not to be penetrated by human sight yet they acknowledged some things to be more likely than others and received into their judgment this faculty that they had a power to incline to one appearance more than another they allowed him this propension interdicting all resolution the pironian opinion is more bold and also somewhat more likely for this academic inclination and this propension to one proposition rather than another what is it other than a recognition of some more apparent truth in this than in that if our understanding be capable of the form lineaments port and face of truth it might as well see it entire as by halves springing and imperfect this appearance of likelihood which makes them rather take the left hand than the right augments it multiply this ounce of verisimilitude that turns the scales to a hundred to a thousand ounces it will happen in the end that the balance will itself end the controversy and determine one choice one entire truth but why do they suffer themselves to incline to and be swayed by verisimilitude if they know not the truth how should they know the similitude of that whereof they do not know the essence either we can absolutely judge or absolutely we cannot if our intellectual and sensible faculties are without foot or foundation if they only pull and drive tis to no purpose that we suffer our judgments to be carried away with any part of their operation what appearance soever they may seem to present us and the surest and most happy seat of our understanding would be that where it kept itself temperate 
upright and inflexible without tottering or without agitation interuisa vera aut falsa ad animi ascensum nihil interest amongst things that seem whether true or false it signifies nothing to the assent of the mind that things do not lodge in us in their form and essence and do not there make their entry by their own force and authority we sufficiently see because if it were so we should receive them after the same manner wine would have the same relish with the sick as with the healthful he who has his finger chapped or benumbed would find the same hardness in wood or iron that he handles that another does foreign subjects then surrender themselves to our mercy and are seated in us as we please now if on our part we received anything without alteration if human grasp were capable and strong enough to seize on truth by our own means these means being common to all men this truth would be conveyed from hand to hand from one to another and at least there would be some one thing to be found in the world amongst so many as there are that would be believed by men with a universal consent but this that there is no one proposition that is not debated and controverted amongst us or that may not be makes it very manifest that our natural judgment does not very clearly discern what it embraces for my judgment cannot make my companions approve of what it approves which is a sign that i seized it by some other means than by a natural power that is in me and in all other men let us lay aside this infinite confusion of opinions which we see even amongst the philosophers themselves and this perpetual and universal dispute about the knowledge of things for this is truly presupposed that men i mean the most knowing the best born and of the best parts are not agreed about any one thing not that heaven is over our heads for they that doubt of everything do also doubt of that and they who deny that we are able to comprehend anything say that we have not comprehended that the heaven is over our heads and these two opinions are without comparison the stronger in number besides this infinite diversity and division through the trouble that our judgment gives ourselves and the uncertainty that every one is sensible of in himself tis easy to perceive that its seat is very unstable and insecure how variously do we judge of things how often do we alter our opinions what i hold and believe today i hold and believe with my whole belief all my instruments and engines seize and take hold of this opinion and become responsible to me for it at least as much as in them lies i could not embrace nor conserve any truth with greater confidence and assurance than i do this i am wholly and entirely possessed with it but has it not befallen me not only once but a hundred a thousand times every day to have embraced some other thing with all the same instruments and in the same condition which i have since judged to be false a man must at least become wise at his own expense 
if i have often found myself betrayed under this color if my touch proves commonly false and my balance unequal and unjust what assurance can i now have more than at other times is it not stupidity and madness to suffer myself to be so often deceived by my guide nevertheless let fortune remove and shift us five hundred times from place to place let her do nothing but incessantly empty and fill into our belief as into a vessel other and other opinions yet still the present and the last is the certain and infallible one for this we must abandon goods honor life health and all posterior res illa reperta perdit et immutat sensus ad pristina quaeque the last things we find out are always best and make us to disrelish all the rest whatever is preached to us and whatever we learn we should still remember that it is man that gives and man that receives tis a mortal hand that presents it to us tis a mortal hand that accepts it the things that come to us from heaven have the sole right and authority of persuasion the sole mark of truth which also we do not see with our own eyes nor receive by our own means that great and sacred image could not abide in so wretched a habitation if god for this end did not prepare it if god did not by his particular and supernatural grace and favor fortify and reform it at least our frail and defective condition ought to make us behave ourselves with more reservedness and moderation in our innovations and changes we ought to remember that whatever we receive into the understanding we often receive things that are false and that it is by the same instruments that so often give themselves the lie and are so often deceived now it is no wonder they should so often contradict themselves being so easy to be turned and swayed by very light occurrences it is certain that our apprehensions our judgment and the faculties of the soul in general suffer according to the movements and alterations of the body which alterations are continual are not our minds more sprightly our memories more prompt and quick and our thoughts more lively in health than in sickness do not joy and gaiety make us receive subjects that present themselves to our souls quite otherwise than care and melancholy do you believe that catullus's verses or those of sappho please an old doting miser as they do a vigorous amorous young man cleomenes the son of anaxandridas being sick his friends reproached him that he had humours and whimsies that were new and unaccustomed i believe it said he neither am i the same man now as when i am in health being now another person my opinions and fancies are also other than they were before in our courts of justice this word is much in use which is spoken of criminals when they find the judges in a good humour gentle and mild gaudeat de bona fortuna let him rejoice in his good fortune for it is most certain that men's judgments are sometimes more prone to condemnation more sharp and severe and at others more facile easy 
and inclined to excuse. He that carries with him from his house the pain of the gout, jealousy, or theft by his man, having his whole soul possessed with anger, it is not to be doubted but that his judgment will lean this way. That venerable senate of the Areopagites used to hear and determine by night, for fear lest the sight of the parties might corrupt their justice. The very air itself and the serenity of heaven will cause some mutation in us, according to these verses in Cicero. Tales sunt hominum mentes quali pater ipse Jupiter octifera lustravit lampade terras. Men's minds are influenced by the external air, dark or serene, as days are foul or fair. Tis not only fevers, debauches, and great accidents that overthrow our judgments. The least things in the world will do it, and we are not to doubt, though we may not be sensible of it, that if a continued fever can overwhelm the soul, a tertian will in some proportionate measure alter it. If an apoplexy can stupefy and totally extinguish the sight of our understanding, we are not to doubt but that a great cold will dazzle it. And consequently there is hardly one single hour in a man's whole life wherein our judgment is in its due place and right condition, our bodies being subject to so many continual mutations, and stuffed with so many several sorts of springs, that I believe the physicians that it is hard but that there must be always some one or other out of order. As to what remains, this malady does not very easily discover itself, unless it be extreme and past remedy. For as much as reason goes always lame, halting, and that, too, as well with falsehood as with truth. And, therefore, tis hard to discover her deviations and mistakes. I always call that appearance of meditation which every one forges in himself, reason. This reason, of the condition of which there may be a hundred contrary ones about one and the same subject, is an instrument of lead and of wax, ductile, pliable, and accommodate to all sorts of biases and to all measures so that nothing remains but the art and skill how to turn and mould it. How uprightly soever a judge may mean, if he does not look well to himself, which few care to do, his inclination to friendship, to relationship, to beauty or revenge, and not only things of that weight, but even the fortuitous instinct that makes us favor one thing more than another, and that, without reason's permission, puts the choice upon us in two equal subjects, or some shadow of like vanity, may insensibly insinuate into his judgment the recommendation or disfavor of a cause, and make the balance dip. I, that watch myself as narrowly as I can, and that have my eyes continually bent upon myself, like one that has no great business to do elsewhere. Quis sub arcto rex gelidae metuatur orae, quid tiridatem tereat, unice securus. I care not whom the northern clime reveres, or what's the king that Tiridates fears? Dare hardly tell the vanity and weakness I find in myself. My foot 
is so unstable and unsteady, I find myself so apt to totter and reel, and my sight so disordered that, fasting, I am quite another man than when full. If health and a fair day smile upon me, I am a very affable, good-natured man. If a corn trouble my toe, I am sullen, out of humor, and not to be seen. The same pace of a horse seems to me one while hard and another easy, and the same way one while shorter and another longer, and the same form one while more, another less agreeable. I am one while for doing everything and another for doing nothing at all, and what pleases me now would be a trouble to me at another time. I have a thousand senseless and casual actions within myself. Either I am possessed by melancholy or swayed by choler. Now by its own private authority sadness predominates in me, and by and by I am as merry as a cricket. When I take a book in hand, I have then discovered admirable graces in such and such passages, and such as have struck my soul. Let me light upon them at another time. I may turn and toss, tumble and rattle the leaves to no purpose. Tis then to me an inform and undiscovered mass. Even in my own writings, I do not always find the air of my first fancy. I know not what I would have said, and am often put to it to correct and pump for a new sense, because I have lost the first that was better. I do nothing but go and come. My judgment does not always advance, it floats and roams. Velut minuta magno de prensa navis in mari vesaniente vento. Like a small bark that's tossed upon the main, when winds tempestuous heave the liquid plain. Very often, as I am apt to do, having for exercise taken to maintain an opinion contrary to my own, my mind, bending and applying itself that way, does so engage me that way that I no more discern the reason of my former belief, and forsake it. I am, as it were, misled by the side to which I incline, be it what it will, and carried away by my own weight. Every one almost would say the same of himself if he considered himself as I do. Preachers very well know that the emotions which steal upon them in speaking animate them towards belief, and that in passion we are more warm in the defense of our proposition, take ourselves a deeper impression of it, and embrace it with greater vehemence and approbation than we do in our colder and more temperate state. You only give your counsel a simple brief of your cause. He returns you a dubious and uncertain answer, by which you find him indifferent which side he takes. Have you feed him well that he may relish it the better? Does he begin to be really concerned and do you find him interested and zealous in your quarrel? His reason and learning will by degrees grow hot in your cause. Behold, an apparent and undoubted truth presents itself to his understanding. He discovers a new light in your business and does in good earnest believe and persuade himself that it is so. Nay, I do not know whether the ardor that springs from spite and obstinacy, 
against the power and violence of the magistrate and danger or the interest of reputation may not have made some men even at the stake maintain the opinion for which at liberty and amongst friends they would not have burned a finger the shocks and jostles that the soul receives from the body's passions can do much in it but its own can do a great deal more to which it is so subjected that perhaps it may be made good that it has no other pace and motion but from the breath of those winds without the agitation of which it would be becalmed and without action like a ship in the middle of the sea to which the winds have denied their assistance and whoever should maintain this siding with the peripatetics would do us no great wrong seeing it is very well known that the greatest and most noble actions of the soul proceed from and stand in need of this impulse of the passions valor they say cannot be perfect without the assistance of anger semper ajax fortis fortissimus tamen in furore ajax was always brave but most when in a fury neither do we encounter the wicked and the enemy vigorously enough if we be not angry nay the advocate it is said is to inspire the judges with indignation to obtain justice irregular desires moved themistocles and demosthenes and have pushed on the philosophers to watching fasting and pilgrimages and lead us to honour learning and health which are all very useful ends and this meanness of soul in suffering anxiety and trouble serves to breed remorse and repentance in the conscience and to make us sensible of the scourge of god and politic correction for the chastisement of our offences compassion is a spur to clemency and the prudence of preserving and governing ourselves is roused by our fear and how many brave actions by ambition how many by presumption in short there is no brave and spiritual virtue without some irregular agitation may not this be one of the reasons that moved the epicureans to discharge god from all care and solicitude of our affairs because even the effects of his goodness could not be exercised in our behalf without disturbing its repose by the means of passions which are so many spurs and instruments pricking on the soul to virtuous actions or have they thought otherwise and taken them for tempests that shamefully hurry the soul from her tranquillity ut maris tranquillitas intelligitur nulla ne minima quidem aura fluctus commovente sic animi quietus et placatus status cernitur quum perturbatis nulla est qua mueri queat as it is understood to be a calm sea when there is not the least breath of air stirring so the state of the soul is discerned to be quiet and appeased when there is no perturbation to move it what varieties of sense and reason what contrariety of imaginations does the diversity of our passions inspire us with what assurance then can we take of a thing so mobile and unstable subject by its condition to the dominion of trouble 
and never going other than a forced and borrowed pace. If our judgment be in the power even of sickness and perturbation, if it be from folly and rashness that it is to receive the impression of things, what security can we expect from it? Is it not a great boldness in philosophy to believe that men perform the greatest actions and nearest approaching the divinity when they are furious, mad, and beside themselves? We better ourselves by the privation of our reason and drilling it. The two natural ways to enter into the cabinet of the gods and there to foresee the course of destiny are fury and sleep. This is pleasant to consider. By the dislocation that passions cause in our reason, we become virtuous. By its extirpation, occasioned by madness or the image of death, we become diviners and prophets. I was never so willing to believe philosophy in anything as this. Tis a pure enthusiasm wherewith sacred truth has inspired the spirit of philosophy, which makes it confess, contrary to its own proposition, that the most calm, composed, and healthful estate of the soul that philosophy can seat it in is not its best condition. Our waking is more asleep than sleep itself, our wisdom less wise than folly. Our dreams are worth more than our meditation, and the worst place we can take is in ourselves. But does not philosophy think that we are wise enough to consider that the voice that the spirit utters, when dismissed from man, so clear-sighted, so great and so perfect, and whilst it is in man so terrestrial, ignorant, and dark, is a voice proceeding from the spirit of dark, terrestrial, and ignorant man, and for this reason a voice not to be trusted and believed. I, being of a soft and heavy complexion, have no great experience of these vehement agitations, the most of which surprise the soul on a sudden, without giving it leisure to recollect itself. But the passion that is said to be produced by idleness in the hearts of young men, though it proceed leisurely and with a measured progress, does evidently manifest, to those who have tried to oppose its power, the violence our judgment suffers in this alteration and conversion. I have formerly attempted to withstand and repel it, for I am so far from being one of those that invite vices that I do not so much as follow them if they do not haul me along. I perceived it to spring, grow, and increase in spite of my resistance. And, at last, living and seeing as I was, wholly to seize and possess me, so that, as if rousing from drunkenness, the images of things began to appear to me quite other than they used to be. I evidently saw the advantages of the object I desired grow and increase and expand by the influence of my imagination, and the difficulties of my attempt to grow more easy and smooth and both my reason and conscience to be laid aside. But this fire being evaporated in an instant, as from a flash of lightning, I was aware that my soul resumed another kind of sight, another state, and another judgment. 
the difficulties of retreat appeared great and invincible, and the same things had quite another taste and aspect than the heat of desire had presented them to me. Which of the two most truly? Piero knows nothing about it. We are never without sickness. Eggs have their hot and cold fits. From the effects of an ardent passion we fall again to shivering. As much as I had advanced, so much I retired. Qualis ubi alterno procurens gorgite pontus, nunc ruit ad terras, scopulisque superiacit undam spumeos extremamque sinu perfundit arenam, nunc rapidus retro atque aestu revoluta resorbens saxa fugit litusque vado labente relinquit. So swelling surges with a thundering roar, driven on each other's backs insult the shore, bound o'er the rocks encroach upon the land, and far upon the beach heave up the sand. Then backward rapidly they take their way, repulsed from upper ground, and seek the sea. Now from the knowledge of this volubility of mine, I have accidentally begot in myself a certain constancy of opinions, and have not much altered those that were first and natural in me. For what appearance soever there may be in novelty, I do not easily change, for fear of losing by the bargain. And as I am not capable of choosing, I take other men's choice, and keep myself in the station wherein God has placed me. I could not otherwise keep myself from perpetual rolling. Thus have I, by the grace of God, preserved myself entire, without anxiety or trouble of conscience, in the ancient faith of our religion, amidst so many sects and divisions as our age has produced. The writings of the ancients, the best authors, I mean, being full and solid, tempt and carry me which way almost they will. He that I am reading seems always to have the most force, and I find that every one in his turn is in the right, though they contradict one another. The facility that good wits have of rendering everything likely they would recommend and that nothing is so strange to which they do not undertake to give color enough to deceive such simplicity as mine, this evidently shows the weakness of their testimony. The heavens and the stars have been three thousand years in motion. All the world were of that belief till Cleanthes the Samian or, according to Theophrastus, Niketas of Syracuse, took it into his head to maintain that it was the earth that moved, turning about its axis by the oblique circle of the zodiac. And Copernicus has in our times so grounded this doctrine that it very regularly serves to all astrological consequences. What use can we make of this, if not that we ought not much to care which is the true opinion. And who knows but that a third, a thousand years hence, may overthrow the two former. Sic volvenda aetas commutat tempora rerum, quod fuit in pretio, fit nullo denique honore, poro aliud succedit, et e contemptibus exit, Inque dies magis appetitur floretque repertum laudibus et miro est mortales inter honore. Thus everything is changed in course of time. 
what now is valued passes soon its prime to which some other thing despised before succeeds and grows in vogue still more and more and once received too faint all praises seem so highly it is raised in men's esteem so that when any new doctrine presents itself to us we have great reason to mistrust and to consider that before that was set on foot the contrary had been generally received and that as that has been overthrown by this a third invention in time to come may start up which may damn the second before the principles that aristotle introduced were in reputation other principles contented human reason as these satisfy us now what patent have these people what particular privilege that the career of our invention must be stopped by them and that the possession of our whole future belief should belong to them they are no more exempt from being thrust out of doors than their predecessors were when any one presses me with a new argument i ought to believe that what i cannot answer another can for to believe all likelihoods that a man cannot confute is great simplicity it would by that means come to pass that all the vulgar and we are all of the vulgar would have their belief as turnable as a weathercock for their souls being so easy to be imposed upon and without any resistance must of force incessantly receive other and other impressions the last still effacing all footsteps of that which went before he that finds himself weak ought to answer according to practice that he will speak with his counsel or refer himself to the wiser from whom he received his instruction how long is it that physic has been practised in the world tis said that a newcomer called paracelsus changes and overthrows the whole order of ancient rules and maintains that till now it has been of no other use but to kill men i believe he will easily make this good but i do not think it were wisdom to venture my life in making trial of his own experience we are not to believe every one says the precept because every one can say all things a man of this profession of novelties and physical reformations not long since told me that all the ancients were notoriously mistaken in the nature and motions of the winds which he would evidently demonstrate to me if i would give him the hearing after i had with some patience heard his arguments which were all full of likelihood of truth what then said i did those that sailed according to theophrastus make way westward when they had the prow towards the east did they go sideward or backward that's fortune answered he but so it is that they were mistaken i replied that i had rather follow effects than reason now these are things that often interfere with one another and i have been told that in geometry which pretends to have gained the highest point of certainty of all science there are inevitable demonstrations found which subvert the truth of all experience as jacques pelletier told me at my own house that he had found out two lines stretching themselves one towards the other to meet which nevertheless he affirmed though extended to infinity could never arrive to touch one another 
and the Pyrrhonians make no other use of their arguments and their reason than to ruin the appearance of experience. And tis a wonder how far the suppleness of our reason has followed them in this design of controverting the evidence of effects. For they affirm that we do not move, that we do not speak, and that there is neither weight nor heat, with the same force of argument that we affirm the most likely things. Ptolemy, who was a great man, had established the bounds of this world of ours. All the ancient philosophers thought they had the measure of it, excepting some remote isles that might escape their knowledge. It had been Pyrrhonism a thousand years ago to doubt the science of cosmography and the opinions that every one had received from it. It was heresy to admit the antipodes. And, behold, in this age of ours there is an infinite extent of terra firma discovered, not an island or single country, but a division of the world nearly equal in greatness to that we knew before. The geographers of our time stick not to assure us that now all is found, all is seen. Nam quod adest praesto placet et polore videtur. What's present pleases and appears the best. But it remains to be seen whether, as Ptolemy was therein formerly deceived upon the foundation of his reason, it were not very foolish to trust now in what these people say, and whether it is not more likely that this great body which we call the world is not quite another thing than what we imagine. Plato says that it changes countenance in all respects, that the heavens, the stars, and the sun have all of them sometimes motions retrograde to what we see, changing east into west. The Egyptian priests told Herodotus that from the time of their first king, which was eleven thousand and odd years since, and they showed him the effigies of all their kings in statues taken from the life, the sun had four times altered his course, that the sea and the earth did alternately change into one another, that the beginning of the world is undetermined. Aristotle and Cicero both say the same, and some amongst us are of opinion that it has been from all eternity, is mortal, and renewed again by several vicissitudes. Calling Solomon and Isaiah to witness, to evade those oppositions, that God has once been a creator without a creature, that he has had nothing to do, that he got rid of that idleness by putting his hand to this work, and that consequently he is subject to change. In the most famous of the Greek schools, the world is taken for a god, made by another god greater than he, and composed of a body and a soul fixed in his center, and dilating himself by musical numbers to his circumference, divine, infinitely happy, and infinitely great, infinitely wise and eternal. In him are other gods, the sea, the earth, the stars, who entertain one another with an harmonious and perpetual agitation and divine dance, sometimes meeting, sometimes retiring from one another, concealing and discovering themselves, changing their order, one while before and another behind. Heraclitus was positive 
that the world was composed of fire and by the order of destiny was one day to be inflamed and consumed in fire and then to be again renewed and apuleius says of men sigillatim mortales cunctim perpetui that they are mortal in particular and immortal in general alexander writ to his mother the narration of an egyptian priest drawn from their monuments testifying the antiquity of that nation to be infinite and comprising the birth and progress of other countries cicero and diodorus say that in their time the chaldees kept a register of four hundred thousand and odd years aristotle pliny and others that zoroaster flourished six thousand years before plato's time plato says that they of the city of sais have records in writing of eight thousand years and that the city of athens was built a thousand years before the said city of sais epicurus that at the same time things are here in the posture we see they are alike and in the same manner in several other worlds which he would have delivered with greater assurance had he seen the similitude and concordance of the new discovered world of the west indies with ours present and past in so many strange examples End of section 49section 50 of essays book 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by cynthia moyer essays book 2 by michel de montaigne translated by charles cotton Apology for Raymond Sebon, Part 10. In earnest, considering what is come to our knowledge from the course of this terrestrial polity, I have often wondered to see in so vast a distance of places and times such a concurrence of so great a number of popular and wild opinions, and of savage manners and beliefs, which by no means seem to proceed from our natural meditation the human mind is a great worker of miracles but this relation has moreover i know not what of extraordinary in it tis found to be in names also and a thousand other things for they found nations there that for aught we know never heard of us where circumcision was in use where there were states and great civil governments maintained by women only without men where our fasts and lent were represented to which was added abstinence from women where our crosses were several ways in repute here they were made use of to honour and adorn their sepulchres there they were erected and particularly that of st andrew to protect themselves from nocturnal visions and to lay upon the cradles of infants against enchantments elsewhere there was found one of wood of very great height which was adored for the god of rain and this a great way in the interior there was seen an express image of our penance priests the use of mitres the celibacy of priests the art of divination by the entrails of sacrificed beasts abstinence from all sorts of flesh and fish in their diet the manner of priests officiating in a particular and not a vulgar language and this fancy 
that the first god was driven away by a second, his younger brother, that they were created with all sorts of necessaries and conveniences, which have since been in a degree taken from them for their sins, their territory changed, and their natural condition made worse, that they were of old overwhelmed by the inundation of water from heaven, that but few families escaped, who retired into caves on high mountains, the mouths of which they stopped so that the waters could not get in, having shut up, together with themselves, several sorts of animals, that when they perceived the rain to cease, they sent out dogs, which, returning clean and wet, they judged that the water was not much abated, afterwards sending out others, and seeing them return dirty, they issued out to repeople the world, which they found only full of serpents. In one place we met with the belief of a day of judgment, insomuch that they were marvellously displeased at the Spaniards for discomposing the bones of the dead, in rifling the sepultures for riches, saying that those bones so disordered could not easily rejoin. The traffic by exchange and no other way, fairs and markets for that end. Dwarfs and deformed people for the ornament of the tables of princes. The use of falconry according to the nature of their hawks. Tyrannical subsidies. Nicety in gardens. Dancing, tumbling tricks, music of instruments, coats of arms, tennis courts, dice and lotteries, wherein they are sometimes so eager and hot as to stake themselves and their liberty. Physic no otherwise than by charms, the way of writing in cipher, the belief of only one first man, the father of all nations, the adoration of one God, who formerly lived a man in perfect virginity, fasting, and penitence, preaching the laws of nature and the ceremonies of religion, and that vanished from the world without a natural death. The theory of giants, the custom of making themselves drunk with their beverages and drinking to the utmost, religious ornaments painted with bones and dead man's skulls, surplices, holy water sprinkled, wives and servants who present themselves with emulation, burnt and interred with the dead husband or master, a law by which the eldest succeeds to all the estate, no part being left for the younger but obedience, the custom that, upon promotion to a certain office of great authority, the promoted is to take upon him a new name, and to leave that which he had before, another to strew lime upon the knee of the newborn child, with these words, From dust thou earnest, and to dust thou must return, as also the art of augury. The vain shadows of our religion, which are observable in some of these examples, are testimonies of its dignity and divinity. It is not only in some sort insinuated into all the infidel nations on this side of the world by a certain imitation, but in these barbarians also, as by a common and supernatural inspiration. For we find there the belief of purgatory, but of a new form, that which we give to the fire they give to the cold, and imagine that souls are purged and punished by the rigor of an excessive coldness. And this example puts me in mind of another pleasant diversity, for as there were there some people who delighted to unmuffle the ends of their instruments, and clipped off the prepuce after the Mahometan and Jewish manner, there were others who made so great conscience of laying it bare, that they carefully pursed it up with little strings, to keep that end from peeping into the air. 
and of this other diversity, that whereas we, to honour kings and festivals, put on the best clothes we have, in some regions, to express their disparity and submission to their king, his subjects present themselves before him in their vilest habits, and entering his palace, throw some old tattered garment over their better apparel, to the end that all the lustre and ornament may solely be in him. But to proceed, if nature enclose within the bounds of her ordinary progress the beliefs, judgments, and opinions of men, as well as all other things, if they have their revolution, their season, their birth and death, like cabbage plants, if the heavens agitate and rule them at their pleasure, what magisterial and permanent authority do we attribute to them? If we experimentally see that the form of our beings depends upon the air, upon the climate, and upon the soil where we are born, and not only the color, the stature, the complexion, and the countenances, but moreover the very faculties of the soul itself. Et plaga celi non solum ad robor corporum, sed etiam animorum facit. The climate is of great efficacy not only to the strength of bodies, but to that of souls also, says Vegetius, and that the goddess who founded the city of Athens chose to situate it in a temperature of air fit to make men prudent, as the Egyptian priests told Solon. Atenis tenue colum, ex quo etiam acutiores putantur attici, crassum tebis, itaque pinguis tebani, et valentes. The air of Athens is subtle and thin, whence also the Athenians are reputed to be more acute, and at Thebes more gross and thick, wherefore the Thebans are looked upon as more heavy-witted and more strong. In such sort that, as fruits and animals grow different, men are also more or less warlike, just, temperate, and docile. Here given to wine, elsewhere to theft or uncleanness, here inclined to superstition, elsewhere to unbelief, in one place to liberty, in another to servitude, capable of one science or of one art, dull or ingenious, obedient or mutinous, good or bad, according as the place where they are seated inclines them, and assume a new complexion if removed, like trees, which was the reason why Cyrus would not grant the Persians leave to quit their rough and craggy country to remove to another more pleasant and even, saying that fertile and tender soils made men effeminate and soft. If we see one while one art and one belief flourish, and another while another, through some celestial influence, such an age to produce such natures, and to incline mankind to such and such a propension, the spirits of men one while gay and another grey, like our fields. What becomes of all those fine prerogatives we so soothe ourselves withal? Seeing that a wise man may be mistaken, and a hundred men and a hundred nations, nay, that even human nature itself, as we believe, is many ages wide in one thing or another, what assurances have we that she should cease to be mistaken, or that in this very age of ours she is not so? Methinks that amongst other testimonies of our imbecility, this ought not to be forgotten, that man cannot, by his own wish and desire, find out what he wants, that not in fruition only, but in imagination and wish, we cannot agree about what we would have to satisfy and content us. 
let us leave it to our own thought to cut out and make up at pleasure it cannot so much as covet what is proper for it and satisfy itself quid enim ratione tememus aut cupimus quid tam dextro pede concipis ut te conatus non poniteat votique peracti for what with reason do we speak or shun what plan how happily soe'er begun that when achieved we do not wish undone and therefore it was that socrates only begged of the gods that they would give him what they knew to be best for him and the private and public prayer of the lacedaemonians was simply for good and useful things referring the choice and election of them to the discretion of the supreme power coniugium petimus partumque uxoris at ille notum qui pueri qualisque futura sit uxor we ask for wives and children they above know only when we have them what they'll prove and christians pray to god thy will be done that they may not fall into the inconvenience the poet feigns of king midas he prayed to the gods that all he touched might be turned into gold his prayer was heard his wine was gold his bread was gold the feathers of his bed his shirt his clothes were all gold so that he found himself overwhelmed with the fruition of his desire and endowed with an intolerable benefit and was fain to unpray his prayers atonitus novitati mali divesque miserque effugere optat opes et quae modo voverat odit astonished at the strangeness of the ill to be so rich yet miserable still he wishes now he could his wealth evade and hates the thing for which before he prayed to instance in myself being young i desired of fortune above all things the order of saint michael which was then the utmost distinction of honour amongst the french nobles and very rare she pleasantly gratified my longing instead of raising me and lifting me up from my own place to attain to it she was much kinder to me for she brought it so low and made it so cheap that it stooped down to my shoulders and lower cleobis and Beto, trophonius and agamedes having requested the first of their goddess the last of their god a recompense worthy of their piety had death for a reward so differing from ours are heavenly opinions concerning what is fit for us god might grant us riches honours life and even health to our own hurt for everything that is pleasing to us is not always good for us if he sends us death or an increase of sickness instead of a cure virga tua et baculus tuus ipsa me consulata sunt thy rod and thy staff have comforted me he does it by the rule of his providence which better and more certainly discerns what is proper for us than we can do and we ought to take it in good part as coming from a wise and most friendly hand si consilium vis permites ipsis expendere nominibus quid conveniat nobis rebusque sit utile nostris carior est illis homo quam sibi if thou'lt be ruled to the gods thy fortunes trust their thoughts are wise their dispensations just what best may profit or delight they know and real good for fancied bliss bestow with eyes of pity they our frailties scan more dear to them than to himself is man 
for to require of him honours and commands is to require that he may throw you into a battle set you upon a cast of dice or something of the like nature whereof the issue is to you unknown and the fruit doubtful there is no dispute so sharp and violent amongst the philosophers as about the question of the sovereign good of man whence by the calculation of varro rose two hundred and eighty-eight sects cui autem de sumo bono dissentit de tota philosophia ratione disputat for whoever enters into controversy concerning the supreme good disputes upon the whole matter of philosophy tres mihi con vivae propre dissentire videntur poscentes vario multum diversa palato quid dem quid non dem renuis tu quod jubet alter quod petis id sane est invisum acidumque duobus i have three guests invited to a feast and all appear to have a different taste what shall i give them what shall i refuse what one dislikes the other two shall choose and e'en the very dish you like the best is acid or insipid to the rest nature should say the same to their contests and debates some say that our well-being lies in virtue others in pleasure others in submitting to nature one in knowledge another in being exempt from pain another in not suffering ourselves to be carried away by appearances and this fancy seems to have some relation to that of the ancient pythagoras nil admirari prope res est una numici solaque quae posit facere et servare beatum not to admires the only art i know can make us happy and can keep us so which is the drift of the pyrrhonian sect aristotle attributes the admiring nothing to magnanimity and archesilaus said that constancy and a right inflexible state of judgment were the true good and consent and application the sin and evil and there it is true in being thus positive and establishing a certain axiom he quitted pyrrhonism for the pyrrhonians when they say that ataraxy which is the immobility of judgment is the sovereign good do not design to speak it affirmatively but that the same motion of soul which makes them avoid precipices and take shelter from the cold presents them such a fancy and makes them refuse another how much do i wish that whilst i live either some other or justus lipsius the most learned man now living of a most polite and judicious understanding truly resembling my turnibus had both the will and health and leisure sufficient carefully and conscientiously to collect into a register according to their divisions and classes as many as are to be found of the opinions of the ancient philosophers about the subject of our being and manners their controversies the succession and reputation of sects with the application of the lives of the authors and their disciples to their own precepts in memorable accidents and upon exemplary occasions what a beautiful and useful work that would be as to what remains if it be from ourselves that we are to extract the rules of our manners upon what a confusion do we throw ourselves for that which our reason advises us to as the most likely is generally for every one to obey the laws of his country as was the advice of socrates inspired as he says by a divine counsel and by that what would it say 
but that our duty has no other rule but what is accidental truth ought to have a like and universal visage if man could know equity and justice that had a body and a true being he would not fetter it to the conditions of this country or that it would not be from the whimsies of the persians or indians that virtue would receive its form there is nothing more subject to perpetual agitation than the laws since i was born i have known those of the english our neighbors three or four times changed not only in matters of civil regimen which is the only thing wherein constancy may be dispensed with but in the most important subject that can be namely religion at which i am the more troubled and ashamed because it is a nation with whom those of my province have formerly had so great familiarity and acquaintance that there yet remains in my house some footsteps of our ancient kindred and here with us at home i have known a thing that was capital to become lawful and we that hold of others are likewise according to the chance of war in a possibility of being one day found guilty of high treason both divine and human should the justice of our arms fall into the power of injustice and after a few years possession take a quite contrary being how could that ancient god more clearly accuse the ignorance of human knowledge concerning the divine being and give men to understand that their religion was but a thing of their own contrivance useful as a bond to their society than declaring as he did to those who came to his tripod for instruction that every one's true worship was that which he found in use in the place where he chanced to be o oh god what infinite obligation have we to the bounty of our sovereign creator for having disabused our belief from these wandering and arbitrary devotions and for having seated it upon the eternal foundation of his holy word but what then will philosophers say to us in this necessity that we follow the laws of our country that is to say this floating sea of the opinions of a republic or a prince that will paint out justice for me in as many colours and form it as many ways as there are changes of passions in themselves i cannot suffer my judgment to be so flexible what kind of virtue is that which i see one day in repute and that to-morrow shall be in none and which the crossing of a river makes a crime what sort of truth can that be which these mountains limit to us and make a lie to all the world beyond them but they are pleasant when to give some certainty to the laws they say that there are some firm perpetual and immovable which they call natural that are imprinted in humankind by the condition of their own proper being and of these some reckon three some four some more some less a sign that it is a mark as doubtful as the rest now they are so unfortunate for what can i call it else but misfortune that of so infinite a number of laws there should not be found one at least that fortune and the temerity of chance has suffered to be universally received by the consent of all nations they are i say so miserable that of these three or four select laws there is not so much as one that is not contradicted and disowned not only by one nation but by many now the only likely sign by which they can argue or infer some natural laws is the universality of approbation for we should without doubt 
follow with a common consent that which nature had truly ordained us and not only every nation but every private man would resent the force and violence that any one should do him who would tempt him to anything contrary to this law but let them produce me one of this condition protagoras and aristo gave no other essence to the justice of laws than the authority and opinion of the legislator and that these laid aside the honest and the good lost their qualities and remained empty names of indifferent things thrasymachus in plato is of opinion that there is no other right but the convenience of the superior there is not anything wherein the world is so various as in laws and customs such a thing is abominable here which is elsewhere in esteem as in lacedaemon dexterity in stealing marriages between near relations are capitally interdicted amongst us they are elsewhere in honour gentes esseferantur in quibus et nato genitrix et nata parenti jungitur et pietas geminato crescit amore there are some nations in the world tis said where fathers daughters sons their mothers wed and their affections thereby higher rise more firm and constant by these double ties the murder of infants the murder of fathers the community of wives traffic of robberies license in all sorts of voluptuousness in short there is nothing so extreme that is not allowed by the custom of some nation or other it is credible that there are natural laws for us as we see them in other creatures but they are lost in us this fine human reason everywhere so insinuating itself to govern and command as to shuffle and confound the face of things according to its own vanity and inconstancy nihil itaque amplius nostrum est quod nostrum dico artis est therefore nothing is any more truly ours what we call ours belongs to art subjects have diverse lustres and diverse considerations and thence the diversity of opinions principally proceeds one nation considers a subject in one aspect and stops there another takes it in a different point of view there is nothing of greater horror to be imagined than for a man to eat his father and yet the people whose ancient custom it was to do so looked upon it as a testimony of piety and affection seeking thereby to give their progenitors the most worthy and honourable sepulture storing up in themselves and as it were in their own marrow the bodies and relics of their fathers and in some sort regenerating them by transmutation into their living flesh by means of nourishment and digestion it is easy to consider what a cruelty and abomination it must have appeared to men possessed and imbued with this superstition to throw their father's remains to the corruption of the earth and the nourishment of beasts and worms lycurgus considered in theft the vivacity diligence boldness and dexterity of purloining anything from our neighbours and the benefit that redounded to the public that every one should look more narrowly to the conservation of what was his own and believed that from this double institution of assaulting and defending advantage was to be made for military discipline 
which was the principal science and virtue to which he would inure that nation, of greater consideration than the disorder and injustice of taking another man's goods. Dionysius, the tyrant, offered Plato a robe of the Persian fashion, long, damasked, and perfumed. Plato refused it, saying, that being born a man he would not willingly dress himself in women's clothes. But Aristippus accepted it with this answer, that no accoutrement could corrupt a chaste courage. His friends reproaching him with meanness of spirit for laying it no more to heart that Dionysius had spit in his face. Fishermen, said he, suffer themselves to be drenched with the waves of the sea from head to foot to catch a gudgeon. Diogenes was washing cabbages, and seeing him pass by, If thou couldst live on cabbage, said he, thou wouldst not fawn upon a tyrant. To whom Aristippus replied, And if thou knewest how to live amongst men, thou wouldst not be washing cabbages. Thus reason finds appearances for diverse effects. Tis a pot with two ears that a man may take by the right or left. Bellum, o terra hospita, portas, bello armantor equi, bellum haec armenta minantur, sed tamen idem olim curu succedere sueti quadrupedes, et frena jugo concordia fere, spes est pacis. War, war is threatened from this foreign ground, my father cried, where warlike steeds are found. Yet since reclaimed, to chariots they submit, and bend to stubborn yokes and champ the bit, peace may succeed to war. Solon, being lectured by his friends not to shed powerless and unprofitable tears for the death of his son. It is for that reason that I the more justly shed them, said he, because they are powerless and unprofitable. Socrates's wife exasperated her grief by this circumstance. Oh, how unjustly do these wicked judges put him to death! Why, replied he, hast thou rather they should execute me justly? We have our ears bored. The Greeks looked upon that as a mark of slavery. We retire in private to enjoy our wives. The Indians do it in public. The Scythians immolated strangers in their temples. Elsewhere temples were a refuge. Inde furor vulgi quod numina vicinorum odit quisque locus, cum solos credat habendos esse deos, quos ipse colet. Thus tis the popular fury that creates, that all their neighbors' gods each nation hates. Each thinks its own the genuine, in a word, the only deities to be adored. I have heard of a judge, who, coming upon a sharp conflict betwixt Bartolus and Aldus, and some point controverted with many contrarieties, writ in the margin of his book, A Question for a Friend. That is to say, that truth was there so controverted and disputed, that in a like cause he might favor which of the parties he thought fit. "'Twas only for want of wit that he did not write a question for a friend throughout. The advocates and judges of our times find bias enough in all causes to accommodate them to what they themselves think fit. In so infinite a science, depending upon the authority of so many opinions, and so arbitrary a subject, it cannot be but that of necessity 
an extreme confusion of judgments must arise. There is hardly any suit so clear wherein opinions do not very much differ. What one court has determined one way, another determines quite contrary, and itself contrary to that at another time of which we see very frequent examples, owing to that practice admitted amongst us, and which is a marvellous blemish to the ceremonious authority and lustre of our justice, of not abiding by one sentence, but running from judge to judge and court to court to decide one and the same cause. As to the liberty of philosophical opinions concerning vice and virtue. Tis not necessary to be insisted upon. Therein are found many opinions that are better concealed than published to weak minds. Arcesilaus said that in venery it was no matter where or with whom it was committed. Et obscenas voluptates si natura requirit non genere aut loco aut ordine sed forma aetate jugura metiendas epicurus putat ne amores quidem sanctos a sapiente alienos esse arbitrantur quaeramus ad quamusque aetatem juvenes amandi sint and obscene pleasures if nature requires them epicurus thinks are not to be measured either by race, kind, place, or rank, but by age, shape, and beauty. Neither are sacred loves thought to be foreign to wise men. We are to inquire till what age young men are to be loved. These last two stoical quotations, and the reproach that Dicaearchus threw into the teeth of Plato himself upon this account, show how much the soundest philosophy indulges licenses and excesses very remote from common custom. Laws derive their authority from possession and custom. Tis dangerous to trace them back to their beginning. They grow great and ennoble themselves like our rivers by running on, but follow them upward to their source, tis but a little spring, scarce discernible, that swells thus, and thus fortifies itself by growing old. Do but consult the ancient considerations that gave the first motion to this famous torrent, so full of dignity, awe, and reverence, you will find them so light and weak that it is no wonder if these people who weigh and reduce everything to reason, and who admit nothing by authority or upon trust, have their judgments often very remote and differing from those of the public. It is no wonder if people who take their pattern from the first image of nature should in most of their opinions swerve from the common path. As, for example, few amongst them would have approved of the strict conditions of our marriages, and most of them have been for having wives in common and without obligation. They would refuse our ceremonies. Chrysippus said, that a philosopher would make a dozen somersaults, aye, and without his breeches, for a dozen of olives. That philosopher would hardly have advised Clisthenes to have refused Hippoclides, the fair Agarista, his daughter, for having seen him stand on his head upon a table. Metrocles somewhat indiscreetly broke wind backwards while in disputation in the presence of a great auditory in his school, and kept himself hid in his own house for shame, till Crates coming to visit him, and adding to his consolations and reasons the example of his own liberty, by falling to try with him who should sound most, 
cured him of that scruple, and withal drew him to his own stoical sect, more free than that more reserved one of the peripatetics, of which he had been till then. That which we call decency, not to dare to do that in public which is decent enough to do in private, the Stoics call foppery, and to mince it, and to be so modest as to conceal and disown what nature, custom, and our desires publish and proclaim of our actions, they reputed a vice. The other thought it was to undervalue the mysteries of Venus, to draw them out of the private oratory, to expose them to the view of the people, and that to bring them out from behind the curtain was to debase them. Modesty is a thing of weight. Secrecy, reservation, and circumspection are parts of esteem. Pleasure did very ingeniously when, under the mask of virtue, she sued not to be prostituted in the open streets, trodden under foot, and exposed to the public view, wanting the dignity and convenience of her private cabinets. Hence some say that to put down public stews is not only to disperse fornication into all places that was confined to one, but moreover by the difficulty to incite wild and idle people to this vice. Mocus es aufidiae, qui vir corvine fuisti, rivalis fuerat cui tuus ille vir est, cur aliena placet tibi quae tua non placet uxor, num quid securus non potes arigere. This experience diversifies itself in a thousand examples. Nullus in urbe fuit tota quitangere velet uxorem gratis, caeciliane tuam dum liquit, sed nunc positis custodibus ingens turba fututorum est, ingeniosus homo es. A philosopher being taken in the very act and asked what he was doing, coldly replied, I am planting man, no more blushing to be so caught than if they had found him planting garlic. It is, I suppose, out of tenderness and respect to the natural modesty of mankind that a great and religious author is of opinion that this act is so necessarily obliged to privacy and shame that he cannot persuade himself there could be any absolute performance in those impudent embraces of the cynics, but that they contented themselves to represent lascivious gestures only to maintain the impudence of their school's profession, and that to eject what shame had withheld and restrained it was afterward necessary for them to withdraw into the shade. But he had not thoroughly examined their debauches, for Diogenes, playing the beast with himself in public, wished, in the presence of all that saw him, that he could fill his belly by that exercise. To those who asked him why he did not find out a more commodious place to eat in than in the open street, he made answer, Because I am hungry in the open street. The women philosophers who mixed with their sect mixed also with their persons, in all places without reservation. And Hipparchia was not received into Crates's society but upon condition that she should, in all things, follow the practice and customs of his rule. These philosophers set a great price upon virtue, and renounce all other discipline but the moral, and yet, in all their actions, they attributed the sovereign authority 
to the election of their sage and above the laws and gave no other curb to voluptuousness but moderation only and the conservation of the liberty of others heraclitus and protagoras forasmuch as wine seemed bitter to the sick and pleasant to the sound the rudder crooked in the water and straight when out and such like contrary appearances as are found in subjects argued thence that all subjects had in themselves the causes of these appearances and there was some bitterness in the wine which had some sympathy with the sick man's taste and the rudder some bending quality sympathizing with him that looks upon it in the water and so of all the rest which is to say that all is in all things and consequently nothing in any one for where all is there is nothing this opinion put me in mind of the experience we have that there is no sense or aspect of any thing whether bitter or sweet straight or crooked that the human mind does not find out in the writings it undertakes to tumble over into the cleanest purest and most perfect words that can possibly be how many lies and falsities have we suggested what heresy has not there found ground and testimony sufficient to make itself embraced and defended tis for this that the authors of such errors will never depart from proof of the testimony of the interpretation of words a person of dignity who would approve to me by authority the search of the philosopher's stone wherein he was head over ears engaged lately alleged to me at least five or six passages of the bible upon which he said he first founded his attempt for the discharge of his conscience for he is a divine and in truth the idea was not only pleasant but moreover very well accommodated to the defence of this fine science by this way the reputation of divining fables is acquired there is no fortune teller if we have this authority but if a man will take the pains to tumble and toss and narrowly to peep into all the folds and glosses of his words he may make him like the sibyls say what he will there are so many ways of interpretation that it will be hard but that either obliquely or in a direct line an ingenious wit will find out in every subject some air that will serve for his purpose therefore we find a cloudy and ambiguous style in so frequent and ancient use let the author but make himself master of that to busy posterity about his predictions which not only his own parts but the accidental favour of the matter itself may do for him and as to the rest express himself whether after a foolish or a subtle manner somewhat obscurely or contradictorily tis no matter a number of wits shaking and sifting him will bring out a great many several forms either according to his meaning or collateral or contrary to it which will all redound to his honour he will see himself enriched by the means of his disciples like the regents of colleges by their pupils yearly presents this it is which has given reputation to many things of no worth at all that has brought several writings in vogue and given them the fame of containing all sorts of matter can be desired one and the same thing receiving a thousand and a thousand images and various considerations nay 
as many as we please. Is it possible that Homer could design to say all that we make him say, and that he designed so many and so various figures as that the divines, lawgivers, captains, philosophers, and all sorts of men who treat of sciences, how variously and opposite soever, should indifferently quote him, and support their arguments by his authority, as the sovereign lord and master of all offices, works, and artisans, and counsellor general of all enterprises. Whoever has had occasion for oracles and predictions has there found sufficient to serve his turn. Tis a wonder how many and how admirable concurrences an intelligent person and a particular friend of mine has there found out in favour of our religion, and cannot easily be put out of the conceit that it was Homer's design. And yet he is as well acquainted with this author as any man whatever of his time. And what he has found in favour of our religion there, very many anciently have found in favour of theirs. Do but observe how Plato is tumbled and tossed about, every one ennobling his own opinions by applying him to himself, and making him take what side they please. They draw him in and engage him in all the new opinions the world receives, and make him, according to the different course of things, differ from himself every one makes him disavow according to his own sense the manners and customs lawful in his age because they are unlawful in ours and all this with vivacity and power according to the force and sprightliness of the wit of the interpreter from the same foundation that heraclitus and this sentence of his had that all things had in them those forms that we discern. Democritus drew quite a contrary conclusion, that objects have in them nothing that we discern in them. And because honey is sweet to one and bitter to another, he thence argued that it was neither sweet nor bitter. The Pyrrhonians would say, that they knew not whether it is sweet or bitter, or whether the one or the other, or both, for these always gained the highest point of dubitation. The Cyrenaics held that nothing was perceptible from without, and that that only was perceptible that inwardly touched us, as pain and pleasure, acknowledging neither sound nor color, but certain affections only that we receive from them, and that man's judgment had no other seat, Protagoras believed that what seems true to every one is true to every one. The Epicureans lodged all judgment in the senses, and in the knowledge of things, and in pleasure. Plato would have the judgment of truth and truth itself derived from opinions and the senses to belong to the wit and cogitation. This discourse has put me upon the consideration of the senses, in which lies the greatest foundation and proof of our ignorance. Whatsoever is known is doubtless known by the faculty of the knower, for seeing the judgment proceeds from the operation of him that judges, tis reason that this operation be performed by his means and will, not by the constraint of another. As it would happen if we knew things by the power and according to the law of their essence. Now all knowledge is conveyed to us by the senses they are our masters. Via qua munita fide, 
proxima fert humanum in pectus templaque mentis it is the surest path that faith can find by which to enter human heart and mind science begins by them and is resolved into them after all we should know no more than a stone if we did not know there is sound odor light taste measure weight softness hardness sharpness color smoothness breadth and depth these are the platforms and principles of the structure of all our knowledge and according to some science is nothing else but sense he that could make me contradict the senses would have me by the throat he could not make me go further back the senses are the beginning and the end of human knowledge invenies primis ab sensibus esse creatam notitiam veri neque sensus posse refeli quid maiori fide poro quam sensus haberi debet of truth whate'er discoveries are made are by the senses to us first conveyed nor will one sense be baffled for on what can we rely more safely than on that let us attribute to them the least we can we must however of necessity grant them this that it is by their means and mediation that all our instruction is directed cicero says that chrysippus having attempted to extenuate the force and virtue of the senses presented to himself arguments and so vehement oppositions to the contrary that he could not satisfy himself therein whereupon cameades who maintained the contrary side boasted that he would make use of the very words and arguments of chrysippus to controvert and confute him and therefore thus cried out against him o miserable thy force has destroyed thee there can be nothing absurd to a greater degree than to maintain that fire does not warm that light does not shine and that there is no weight nor solidity in iron which are things conveyed to us by the senses neither is there belief nor knowledge in man that can be compared to that for certainty the first consideration i have upon the subject of the senses is that i make a doubt whether or no man be furnished with all natural senses i see several animals who live an entire and perfect life some without sight others without hearing who knows whether to us also one two three or many other senses may not be wanting for if any one be wanting our examination cannot discover the defect tis the privilege of the senses to be the utmost limit of our discovery there is nothing beyond them that can assist us in exploration not so much as one sense in the discovery of another an poterunt oculus aures reprehendere an aures tactus an hunc poro tactum sapor arguet oris an cofutabunt nares oculive revincent can ears the eyes the touch the ears correct or is that touch by tasting to be checked or the other senses shall the nose or eyes confute in their peculiar faculties they all make the extremest limits of our ability seorsum cuique potestas divisa est sua vis cuique est each has its power distinctly and alone 
and every sense's power is its own. It is impossible to make a man naturally blind conceive that he does not see, impossible to make him desire sight or to regret his defect, for which reason we ought not to derive any assurance from the soul's being contented and satisfied with those we have, considering that it cannot be sensible herein of its infirmity and imperfection, if there be any such thing. It is impossible to say anything to this blind man, either by reasoning, argument, or similitude, that can possess his imagination with any apprehension of light, color, or sight. There's nothing remains behind that can push on the senses to evidence. Those that are born blind, whom we here wish they could see, it is not that they understand what they desire. They have learned from us that they want something, that there is something to be desired that we have, which they can name indeed and speak of its effect and consequences, but yet they know not what it is, nor apprehend it at all. I have seen a gentleman of a good family who was born blind, or at least blind from such an age that he knows not what sight is, who is so little sensible of his defect that he makes use, as we do, of words proper for seeing, and applies them after a manner wholly particular and his own. They brought him a child to which he was godfather, which, having taken into his arms, Good God, said he, what a fine child, how beautiful to look upon, what a pretty face it has. He will say, like one of us, This room has a very fine prospect. It is clear weather. The sun shines bright. And, moreover, being that hunting, tennis, and butts are our exercises, and he has heard so, he has taken a liking to them, will ride a hunting, and believes he has as good share of the sport as we have, and will express himself as angry or pleased as the best of us all, and yet knows nothing of it but by the ear. One cries out to him, Here's a hare! when he is upon some even plain where he may safely ride. And, afterwards, when they tell him, the hare is killed, he will be as overjoyed and proud of it as he hears others say they are. He will take a tennis ball in his left hand and strike it away with the racket. He will shoot with a harquebus at random, and is contented with what his people tell him, that he is over or wide. End of section 50section 51 of Essays, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. Essays, Book 2, by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Apology for Raymond Seban, Part 11. Who knows whether all humankind commit not the like absurdity for want of some sense, and that through this default the greatest part of the face of things is concealed from us? What do we know but that the difficulties which we find in several works of nature proceed hence, and that several effects of animals which exceed our capacity 
are not produced by faculty of some sense that we are defective in, and whether some of them have not by this means a life more full and entire than ours. We seize an apple with all our senses. We there find redness, smoothness, odor, and sweetness. But it may have other virtues besides these, as to heat or binding, which no sense of ours can have any reference unto. Is it not likely that there are sensitive faculties in nature that are fit to judge of and to discern those which we call the occult properties in several things, as for the lodestone to attract iron, and that the want of such faculties is the cause that we are ignorant of the true essence of such things. Tis perhaps some particular sense that gives cocks to understand what hour it is at midnight, and when it grows to be towards day, and that makes them crow accordingly. That teaches chickens, before they have any experience of the matter, to fear a sparrow-hawk, and not a goose or a peacock, though birds of a much larger size, that cautions them against the hostile quality the cat has against them, and makes them not to fear a dog, to arm themselves against the mewing, a kind of flattering voice of the one, and not against the barking, a shrill and threatening voice of the other that teaches wasps, ants, and rats to fall upon the best pear and the best cheese before they have tasted them, and inspires the stag, elephant, and serpent with the knowledge of a certain herb proper for their cure. There is no sense that has not a mighty dominion, and that does not by its power introduce an infinite number of knowledges. If we were defective in the intelligence of sounds, of harmony, and of the voice, it would cause an unimaginable confusion in all the rest of our science. For besides what belongs to the proper effect of every sense, how many arguments, consequences, and conclusions do we draw to other things by comparing one sense with another? Let an understanding man imagine human nature originally produced without the sense of seeing, and consider what ignorance and trouble such a defect would bring upon him, what a darkness and blindness in the soul. He will then see by that of how great importance to the knowledge of truth the privation of such another sense, or of two or three, should we be so deprived, would be. We have formed a truth by the consultation and concurrence of our five senses, but perhaps we should have the consent and contribution of eight or ten to make a certain discovery of it in its essence. The sects that controvert the knowledge of man do it principally by the uncertainty and weakness of our senses. For since all knowledge is by their means and mediation conveyed unto us, if they fail in their report, if they corrupt or alter what they bring us from without, if the light which by them creeps into the soul be obscured in the passage, we have nothing else to hold by. From this extreme difficulty all these fancies proceed. That every subject has in itself all we there find, that it has nothing in it of what we think we there find, and that of the Epicureans, that the sun is no bigger than tis judged by our sight to be. Quisquid id est nihilo fertur maiore figura, 
quam nostris oculis quam cernimus esse videtur. But be it what it will in our steams, it is no bigger than to us it seems. That the appearances which represent a body great to him that is near, and less to him that is more remote, are both true. Nectamen hic oculis falli concedimus hilum, proinde animi vitium hoc oculis ad fingere noli. Yet that the eyes deluded we deny, charge not the mind's faults, therefore, on the eye. And resolutely that there is no deceit in the senses, that we are to lie at their mercy and seek elsewhere reasons to excuse the difference and contradictions we there find, even to the inventing of lies and other flams, if it come to that, rather than accuse the senses. Timagoras vowed that by pressing or turning his eye he could never perceive the light of the candle to double, and that the seeming so proceeded from the vice of opinion and not from the instrument. The most absurd of all absurdities with the Epicureans is to deny the force and effect of the senses. Proinde, quod in quoque est his visum tempore, verum est, et si non poteret ratio dissolvere causam, cur ea quae fuerent juxtim quadrata, proculsint visa rotunda. Tamen praestat rationes egentem, redere mendoza causas utriusque figurae, quam manibus manifesta suis, Imitere quaequam, et violare fidem primam, et convelere tota fundamenta, quibus nixatur vita salusque. Non modo enem ratio ruat omnis, vita quoque ipsa concidat ex templo, nisi credere sensibus ausis, praecipitesque locos vitare, et caetera, quae sint in genere hoc fugienda. That what we see exists I will maintain, and if our feeble reason can't explain why things seem square when they are very near, and at a greater distance round appear, tis better yet for him that's at a pause to assign to either figure a false cause than shock his faith and the foundations rend on which our safety and our life depend. For reason not alone, but life and all, together will with sudden ruin fall. Unless we trust our senses, nor despise to shun the various dangers that arise. This so desperate and unphilosophical advice expresses only this, that human knowledge cannot support itself but by reason, unreasonable, foolish, and mad, but that it is yet better that man, to set a greater value upon himself, make use of any other remedy, how fantastic soever, than to confess his necessary ignorance a truth so disadvantageous to him. He cannot avoid owning that the senses are the sovereign lords of his knowledge, but they are uncertain and falsifiable in all circumstances. Tis there that he is to fight it out to the last, and, if his just forces fail him, as they do, to supply that defect with obstinacy temerity, and impudence. In case what the Epicureans say be true, viz., that we have no knowledge if the senses' appearances be false, and if that also be true which the Stoics say, 
that the appearances of the senses are so false that they can furnish us with no manner of knowledge. We shall conclude, to the disadvantage of these two great dogmatical sects, that there is no science at all. As to the error and uncertainty of the operation of the senses, every one may furnish himself with as many examples as he pleases, so ordinary are the faults and tricks they put upon us. In the echo of a valley the sound of a trumpet seems to meet us, which comes from a place behind. Extantesque procul medio de gurgite montes, classibus inter quos liber patet exitus, idem apparent et longe de vosilicet, ingens insula conjunctis tamen ex his una videtur. Et fugere ad pupim colles campique videntur, quos agimus praeter navim velisque volamus. Ubi in medio nobis equus acer obhaisit flumine equi corpus transversum fere videtur, vis et in adversum flumen contrudere raptim. And rocks i the seas that proudly raise their head, though far disjoined, though royal navies spread their sails between, yet if from distance shone, they seem an island all combined in one. Thus ships, though driven by a prosperous gale, seem fixed to sailors, those seem under sail that ride at anchor safe, and all admire as they row by to see the rocks retire. Thus, when in rapid streams my horse hath stood, and I looked downward on the rolling flood, though he stood still, I thought he did divide the headlong streams and strive against the tide, and all things seemed to move on every side. Take a musket ball under the forefinger, the middle finger being lapped over it. It feels so like two that a man will have much ado to persuade himself there is but one. The end of the two fingers feeling each of them one at the same time. For that the senses are very often masters of our reason and constrain it to receive impressions which it judges and knows to be false, is frequently seen. I set aside the sense of feeling that has its functions nearer, more lively, and substantial, that so often by the effects of the pains it helps the body to, subverts and overthrows all those fine stoical resolutions, and compels him to cry out of his belly, who has resolutely established this doctrine in his soul, that the colic and all other pains and diseases are indifferent things, not having the power to abate anything of the sovereign felicity wherein the wise man is seated by his virtue. There is no heart so effeminate that the rattle and sound of our drums and trumpets will not inflame with courage, nor so sullen that the harmony of our music will not rouse and cheer, nor so stubborn a soul that will not feel itself struck with some reverence in considering the gloomy vastness of our churches, the variety of ornaments, and order of our ceremonies and in hearing the solemn music of our organs, and the grace and devout harmony of our voices. Even those that come in with contempt feel a certain shivering in their hearts, and something of dread that makes them begin to doubt their opinions. For my part, I do not think myself strong enough to hear an ode of Horace or Catullus sung by a beautiful young mouth without emotion. 
and Zeno had reason to say that the voice was the flower of beauty. One would once make me believe that a certain person, whom all we Frenchmen know, had imposed upon me in repeating some verses that he had made, that they were not the same upon paper that they were in the air, and that my eyes would make a contrary judgment to my ears. So great a power has pronunciation to give fashion and value to works that are left to the efficacy and modulation of the voice. And therefore Philoxenus was not so much to blame hearing one giving an ill accent to some composition of his, in spurning and breaking certain earthen vessels of his, saying, I break what is thine, because thou corruptest what is mine. To what end did those men who have, with a firm resolution, destroyed themselves, turn away their faces, that they might not see the blow that was by themselves appointed? and that those who, for their health, desire and command incisions to be made, and cauteries to be applied to them, cannot endure the sight of the preparations, instruments, and operations of the surgeon, being that the sight is not in any way to participate in the pain. Are not these proper examples to verify the authority the senses have over the imagination? "'Tis to much purpose that we know these tresses were borrowed from a page or a lackey, that this rouge came from Spain, and this pearl powder from the ocean sea. Our sight will nevertheless compel us to confess their subject more agreeable and more lovely against all reason, for in this there is nothing of its own. Auferimur coltu, gemis auroque teguntur, crimina pars minima est ipsa puella sui, saipe ubisit quod ames, inter tam multa requiras, decipit hoc oculos aegide dives amor. By dress we are one, gold, gems, and rich brocades, make up the pageant that your heart invades. In all that glittering figure which you see, the far least part of her own self is she. In vain for her you love, amidst such cost, you search, the mistress in such dress is lost. What a strange power do the poets attribute to the senses that make Narcissus so desperately in love with his own shadow! Cunctaque miratur quibus est mirabilis ipse, se cupit imprudens et qui probat ipse probatur, dumque petit petitur, pariterque accendit et ardet. Admireth all for which to be admired, and inconsiderately himself desired. The praises which he gives his beauty claimed who seeks is sought, the inflamer is inflamed. And Pygmalion's judgment, so troubled by the impression of the sight of his ivory statue, that he loves and adores it as if it were a living woman. Osculadat, redique putat, sequiturque tenetque, et credit tactis digitos insidere membres, et metuit pressus veniat ne livor in artus. He kisses and believes he's kissed again, seizes and twixt his arms his love doth strain, and thinks the polished ivory thus held doth to his fingers amorous pressure yield, and has a timorous fear lest black and blue should in the parts with ardour pressed ensue. Put a philosopher into a cage of small, thin-set bars of iron, 
hang him on the top of the high tower of notre dame at paris he will see by manifest reason that he cannot possibly fall and yet he will find unless he has been used to the plumber's trade that he cannot help but the sight of the excessive height will fright and astound him for we have enough to do to assure ourselves in the galleries of our steeples if they are made with open work although they are of stone and some there are that cannot endure so much as to think of it let there be a beam thrown over betwixt these two towers of breadth sufficient to walk upon there is no philosophical wisdom so firm that can give us the courage to walk over it as we should do upon the ground i have often tried this upon our mountains in these parts and though i am one who am not the most subject to be afraid i was not able to endure to look into that infinite depth without horror and trembling though i stood above my length from the edge of the precipice and could not have fallen unless i would where i also observed that what height soever the precipice was provided there were some tree or some jutting out of a rock a little to support and divide the sight it a little eases our fears and gives greater assurance as if they were things by which in falling we might have some relief but that direct precipices we are not to look upon without being giddy ut despici sine vertigine simul oculorum animique non posit to that one cannot look without dizziness which is a manifest imposture of the sight and therefore it was that that fine philosopher put out his own eyes to free the soul from being diverted by them and that he might philosophize at greater liberty but by the same rule he should have dammed up his ears that theophrastus says are the most dangerous instruments about us for receiving violent impressions to alter and disturb us and finally should have deprived himself of all his other senses that is to say of his life and being for they have all the power to command our soul and reason fit etiam saepe specie quadam saepe vocum gravitate et cantibus ut pelantur animi vehementius saepe etiam cura et timore for it often falls out that the minds are more vehemently struck by some sight by the quality and sound of the voice or by singing and oft times also by grief and fear physicians hold that there are certain complexions that are agitated by the same sounds and instruments even to fury i have seen some who could not hear a bone gnawed under the table without impatience and there is scarce any man who is not disturbed at the sharp and shrill noise that the file makes in grating upon the iron as also to hear chewing near them or to hear any one speak who has an impediment in the throat or nose will move some people even to anger and hatred of what use was that piping prompter of gracchus who softened raised and moved his master's voice whilst he declaimed at rome if the movements and quality of the sound had not the power to move and alter the judgments of the auditory in earnest there is wonderful reason to keep such a clutter about the firmness of this fine piece that suffers itself to be turned and twined by the motion and accidents of so light a wind the same cheat that the senses put upon our understanding they have in turn put upon them the soul also sometimes has its revenge 
they lie and contend which should most deceive one another. What we see and hear when we are transported with passion, we neither see nor hear as it is. Et solem geminum et duplices se ostendere tebas. Thebes seems two cities, and the sun two suns. The object that we love appears to us more beautiful than it really is. Multimodus igitur prawas turpesque videmus, esse in deliciis, sumoque in honore vigere. Hence tis that ugly things in fancied dress seem gay, look fair to lovers' eyes, and please. And that we hate more ugly. To a discontented and afflicted man the light of the day seems dark and overcast. Our senses are not only depraved, but very often stupefied by the passions of the soul. How many things do we see that we do not take notice of if the mind be occupied with other thoughts? In rebus quoque apertis noscere possis, si non advertas animum, proinde esse quasi omni tempore semotae fuerint, longeque remotae. Nay, even in plainest things, unless the mind take heed unless she sets herself to find the thing no more is seen no more beloved than if the most obscure and most removed it would appear that the soul retires within and amuses the powers of the senses and so both the inside and the outside of man is full of infirmity and falsehood they who have compared our lives to a dream were, perhaps, more in the right than they were aware of. When we dream, the soul lives, works, and exercises all its faculties, neither more nor less than when awake, but more largely and obscurely, yet not so much neither that the difference should be as great as betwixt night and the meridian brightness of the sun, but as betwixt night and shade. There she sleeps, here she slumbers, but whether more or less, tis still dark, and Cimmerian darkness. We wake sleeping, and sleep waking. I do not see so clearly in my sleep, but as to my being awake, I never found it clear enough and free from clouds. Moreover, sleep, when it is profound, sometimes rocks even dreams themselves asleep. But our waking is never so sprightly that it rightly purges and dissipates those whimsies which are waking dreams, and worse than dreams. Our reason and soul receiving those fancies and opinions that come in dreams, and authorizing the actions of our dreams with the like approbation that they do those of the day. Wherefore do we not doubt whether our thought, our action, is not another sort of dreaming, and our waking a certain kind of sleep? If the senses be our first judges, it is not ours that we are alone to consult, for in this faculty beasts have as great or greater than we. It is certain that some of them have the sense of hearing more quick than man, others that of seeing, others that of feeling, others that of touch and taste. Democritus said that the gods and brutes had the sensitive faculties more perfect than man, but betwixt the effects of their senses and ours the difference is extreme. Our spittle cleanses and dries up our wounds. It kills the serpent. Tantaque in his rebus distantia differitasque est, ut quod aliis cibus est, 
aliis fuat acre venenum, saipe et enim serpens, hominis contacta saliva, disperit, ac sese mandendo conficit ipsa. And in those things the difference is so great that what's one's poison is another's meat. For serpents often have been seen, tis said, when touched with human spittle, to go mad, and bite themselves to death. What quality shall we attribute to our spittle, as it affects ourselves, or as it affects the serpent? By which of the two senses shall we prove the true essence that we seek for? Pliny says there are certain sea hares in the Indies that are poison to us and we to them, insomuch that with the least touch we kill them. Which shall be truly poison, the man or the fish? Which shall we believe, the fish of the man or the man of the fish? One quality of the air infects a man that does the ox no harm, some other infects the ox, but hurts not the man. Which of the two shall, in truth and nature, be the pestilent quality? To them who have the jaundice, all things seem yellow and paler than to us. Lurida praeterea fiunt quaecunque tuentur arcati. Besides whatever jaundiced eyes do view, looks pale as well as those, and yellow, too. They who are troubled with the disease that the physicians call hyposphagma, which is a suffusion of blood under the skin, see all things red and bloody. What do we know but that these humours which thus alter the operations of sight predominate in beasts and are usual with them? for we see some whose eyes are yellow, like us who have the jaundice, and others of a bloody colour, tis likely that the colours of objects seem other to them than to us. Which of the two shall make a right judgment? For it is not said that the essence of things has a relation to man only. Hardness, whiteness, depth, and sharpness have reference to the service and knowledge of animals as well as to us, and nature has equally designed them for their use. When we press down the eye, the body that we look upon we perceive to be longer and more extended. Many beasts have their eyes so pressed down. This length, therefore, is perhaps the true form of that body, and not that which our eyes give it in the usual state. If we close the lower part of the eye, things appear double to us. Bina lucernarum florentia lumina flamis, et duplices hominum facies et corpora bina. One lamp seems double, and the men appear, each on two bodies, double heads to bear. If our ears be hindered, or the passage stopped with anything, we receive the sound quite otherwise than we usually do. Animals, likewise, who have either the ears hairy, or but a very little hole instead of an ear, do not, consequently, hear as we do, but receive another kind of sound. We see at festivals and theatres that opposing a painted glass of a certain colour to the light of the flambeau, all things in the place appear to us green, yellow, or violet. Et vulgo faciunt id lutea rusaque vela, et ferruginea cum magnis intenta teatris, per malos vulgata trabesque trementia pendent. Namque ibi concessum caviae subter, et omnem scenae speciem, patrum, matrumque, deorumque, inficiunt, coguntque, suo fluitare colore. Thus, 
when pale curtains or the deeper red o'er all the spacious theatre are spread which mighty masts and sturdy pillars bear and the loose curtains wanton in the air whole streams of colours from the summit flow the rays divide them in their passage through and stain the scenes and men and gods below tis likely that the eyes of animals which we see to be of diverse colours produce the appearance of bodies the same with their eyes we should therefore to make a right judgment of the oppositions of the senses be first agreed with beasts and secondly amongst ourselves which we by no means are but enter into dispute every time that one hears sees or tastes something otherwise than another does and contests as much as upon any other thing about the diversity of the images that the senses represent to us a child by the ordinary rule of nature hears sees and talks otherwise than a man of thirty years old and he than one of threescore the senses are in some more obscure and dusky and more open and quick in others we receive things variously according as we are and according as they appear to us those rings which are cut out in the form of feathers which are called endless feathers no eye can discern their size or can keep itself from the deception that on one side they enlarge and on the other contract and come to a point even when the ring is being turned round the finger yet when you feel them they seem all of an equal size now our perception being so uncertain and so controverted it is no more a wonder if we are told that we may declare that snow appears white to us but that to affirm that it is in its own essence really so is more than we are able to justify and this foundation being shaken all the knowledge in the world must of necessity fall to ruin what do our senses themselves hinder one another a picture seems raised and embossed to the sight in the handling it seems flat to the touch shall we say that musk which delights the smell and is offensive to the taste is agreeable or no there are herbs and unguents proper for one part of the body that are hurtful to another honey is pleasant to the taste but offensive to the sight they who to assist their lust used in ancient times to make use of magnifying glasses to represent the members they were to employ bigger by that ocular tumidity to please themselves the more to which of their senses did they give the prize whether to the sight that represented the members as large and great as they would desire or to the feeling which represented them little and contemptible are they our senses that supply the subject with these different conditions and have the subjects themselves nevertheless but one as we see in the bread we eat it is nothing but bread but by being eaten it becomes bones blood flesh hair and nails ut cibus in membra atque artus cum diditur omnes disperit atque aliam naturam sufficit ex se as meats diffused through all the members lose their former state and different things compose the humidity sucked up by the root of a tree becomes trunk leaf and fruit and the air being but one is modulated in a trumpet to a thousand sorts of sounds are they our senses 
I would fain know, that in like manner form these subjects into so many diverse qualities, or have they them really such in themselves? And upon this doubt what can we determine of their true essence? Moreover, since the accidents of disease, of raving, or sleep, make things appear otherwise to us than they do to the healthful, the wise, and those that are awake, is it not likely that our right posture of health and understanding, and our natural humours, have also wherewith to give a being to things that have a relation to their own condition, and accommodate them to themselves, as well as when they are disordered? that health is as capable of giving them an aspect as sickness. Why has not the temperate a certain form of objects relative to it as well as the intemperate? And why may it not as well stamp it with its own character as the other? He whose mouth is out of taste says the wine is flat. The healthful man commends its flavor, and the thirsty its briskness. Now our condition always accommodating things to itself, and transforming them according to its own posture, we cannot know what things truly are in themselves, seeing that nothing comes to us but what is falsified and altered by the senses. Where the compass, the square, and the rule are crooked, all propositions drawn thence, and all buildings erected by those guides, must of necessity be also defective. The uncertainty of our senses renders everything uncertain that they produce. Denique ut in fabrica si prava es regula prima, normaque si fallax rectis regionibus exit et libella aliqua si ex parti claudicat hilum, omnia mendosa fieri atque obstipa necessum est, prava, cubantia, prona, supina, atque absona tecta. Iam ruere ut quaedam videantur vela ruantque prodita judiciis falacibus omnia primis. Hic igitur ratio tibi rerum prava necessa est, falsaque sit, falsis quae cumque a sensibus orta est. But lastly, as in building, if the line be not exact and straight, the rule decline, or level false, how vain is the design! Uneven, an ill-shaped and tottering wall must rise, this part must sink, that part must fall, because the rules were false that fashioned all. Thus reason's rules are false if all commence and rise from failing and from erring sense. As to what remains, who can be fit to judge of and to determine those differences? As we say in controversies of religion, that we must have a judge neither inclining to the one side nor the other, free from all choice and affection, which cannot be amongst Christians, just so it falls out in this. For if he be old, he cannot judge of the sense of old age, being himself a party in the case. If young, there is the same exception. If healthful, sick, asleep, or awake, he is still the same incompetent judge. We must have some one exempt from all these propositions as of things indifferent to him, and, by this rule, we must have a judge that never was. To judge of the appearances that we receive of subjects, we ought to have a deciding instrument. To verify this instrument, we must have demonstration. To verify this demonstration, an instrument. 
and here we are round again upon the wheel and no further advanced seeing the senses cannot determine our dispute being full of uncertainty themselves it must then be reason that must do it but no reason can be erected upon any other foundation than that of another reason and so we run back to all infinity our fancy does not apply itself to things that are strange but is conceived by the mediation of the senses and the senses do not comprehend a foreign subject but only their own passions by which means fancy and appearance are no part of the subject but only of the passion and sufferance of sense which passion and subject are different things wherefore whoever judges by appearances judges by another thing than the subject and to say that the passions of the senses convey to the soul the quality of foreign subjects by resemblance how can the soul and understanding be assured of this resemblance having of itself no commerce with foreign subjects as they who never knew socrates cannot when they see his picture say it is like him now whoever would notwithstanding judge by appearances if it be by all it is impossible because they hinder one another by their contrarieties and discrepancies as we by experience see shall some select appearances govern the rest you must verify this select by another select the second by a third and thus there will never be any end to it finally there is no constant existence neither of the objects being nor our own both we and our judgments and all mortal things are ever more incessantly running and rolling and consequently nothing certain can be established from the one to the other both the judging and the judged being in a continual motion and mutation we have no communication with being by reason that all human nature is always in the middle betwixt being born and dying giving but an obscure appearance and shadow a weak and uncertain opinion of itself and if perhaps you fix your thought to apprehend your being it would be but like grasping water for the more you clutch your hand to squeeze and hold what is in its own nature flowing so much more you lose of what you would grasp and hold so seeing that all things are subject to pass from one change to another reason that there looks for a real substance finds itself deceived not being able to apprehend anything that is subsistent and permanent because that everything is either entering into being and is not yet arrived at it or begins to die before it is born plato said that bodies had never any existence but only birth conceiving that homer had made the ocean and thetis father and mother of the gods to show us that all things are in a perpetual fluctuation motion and variation the opinion of all the philosophers as he says before his time parmenides only excepted who would not allow things to have motion on the power whereof he sets a mighty value pythagoras was of opinion that all matter was flowing and unstable the stoics that there is no time present and that what we call so is nothing but the juncture and meeting of the future and the past heraclitus that never any man entered twice into the same river epicharmus 
that he who borrowed money but an hour ago does not owe it now and that he who was invited overnight to come the next day to dinner comes nevertheless uninvited considering that they are no more the same men but are become others and that there could not a mortal substance be found twice in the same condition for by the suddenness and quickness of the change it one while disperses and another reunites it comes and goes after such a manner that what begins to be born never arrives to the perfection of being forasmuch as that birth is never finished and never stays as being at an end but from the seed is evermore changing and shifting one to another as human seed is first in the mother's womb made a formless embryo after delivered thence a sucking infant afterwards it becomes a boy then a youth then a man and at last a decrepit old man so that age and subsequent generation is always destroying and spoiling that which went before mutat enim mundi naturam totius aetas ex aleoque alius status ex cipere omnia debet nec manet illa sui similis res omnia migrant omnia commutat natura et vertere cogit for time the nature of the world translates and from preceding gives all things new states not like itself remains but all do range and nature forces everything to change and yet we foolishly fear one kind of death whereas we have already passed and do daily pass so many others for not only as heraclitus said the death of fire is generation of air and the death of air generation of water but moreover we may more manifestly discern it in ourselves manhood dies and passes away when age comes on and youth is terminated in the flower of age of a full-grown man infancy in youth and the first age dies in infancy yesterday died in to-day and to-day will die in to-morrow and there is nothing that remains in the same state or that is always the same thing and that it is so let this be the proof if we are always one and the same how comes it to pass that we are now pleased with one thing and by and by with another how comes it to pass that we love or hate contrary things that we praise or condemn them how comes it to pass that we have different affections and no more retain the same sentiment in the same thought for it is not likely that without mutation we should assume other passions and that which suffers mutation does not remain the same and if it be not the same it is not at all but the same that the being is does like it unknowingly change and alter becoming evermore another from another thing and consequently the natural senses abuse and deceive themselves taking that which seems for that which is for want of well knowing what that which is is but what is it then that truly is that which is eternal that is to say that never had beginning nor never shall have ending and to which time can bring no mutation for time is a mobile thing and that appears as in a shadow with a matter ever more flowing and running without ever remaining stable and permanent and to which belong those words before and 
after, has been, or shall be, which at the first sight evidently show that it is not a thing that is, for it were a great folly and a manifest falsity to say that that is which is not yet being, or that has already ceased to be. And as to these words, present, instant, and now, by which it seems that we principally support and found the intelligence of time, reason discovering does presently destroy it, for it immediately divides and splits it into the future and past, being of necessity to consider it divided in two. The same happens to nature that is measured as to time that measures it, for she has nothing more subsisting and permanent than the other, but all things are either born, bearing, or dying. So that it were sinful to say of God, who is he only who is, that he was or that he shall be. For those are terms of declension, transmutation, and vicissitude, of what cannot continue or remain in being. Wherefore we are to conclude that God alone is, not according to any measure of time, but according to an immutable and an immovable eternity, not measured by time, nor subject to any declension before whom nothing was, and after whom nothing shall be, either more new or more recent, but a real being, that with one soul now fills the forever, and that there is nothing that truly is but he alone, without our being able to say he has been or shall be, without beginning, and without end. To this so religious conclusion of a pagan, I shall only add this testimony of one of the same condition for the close of this long and tedious discourse, which would furnish me with endless matter. What a vile and abject thing, says he, is man, if he do not raise himself above humanity. Tis a good word and a profitable desire, but withal absurd. For to make the handle bigger than the hand, the cubit longer than the arm, and to hope to stride further than our legs can reach, is both impossible and monstrous. Or that man should rise above himself and humanity, for he cannot see but with his eyes, nor sees but with his hold. He shall be exalted if God will lend him an extraordinary hand. He shall exalt himself by abandoning and renouncing his own proper means, and by suffering himself to be raised and elevated by means purely celestial. It belongs to our Christian faith, and not to the stoical virtue, to pretend to that divine and miraculous metamorphosis. End of section 51. End of Essays, Book 2, by Michel de Montaigne, translated by Charles Cotton.